Come on now. This is the New York Hardcore Chronicles live. Often imitated, never duplicated. And I am your host. I am your hostess with the mostess. <laughs> What's going on? I got a good feeling about today. I hope you do too. Good to see everybody out there. What's up? What's up, Ackerman? Down there in Tallahassee. What's up, Ray Hogan up there in Stanford, Connecticut? What's happening, Sid the Kid in Manhattan? <laughs> what's up, Tim? What do you say, buddy? Dominic, what's going on out there in Queens, man? You holding it down? All right, all right. Yeah, there you go. What's up, Hags? All right, the gang's all here. What do you say we do a show? What do you say we get jiggy with it, huh? Let's do what we love doing. Let's connect. Jimmy Hazel, 24-7 Spies, my man. Come on now. What's up, Jimmy? Getting ready for that show, Jimmy? Come on. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. It's a yuppa. Where is, you know what? That reminds me. Quickly. Let's talk about the next four shows here. Coming up this Sunday. This is like becoming like a drummer's show. And what we do is have drummers on this show. Coming up this Sunday. Sunday, November 21st, Veronica Bellino from Life of Agony, DMC and the Hellraisers, <clears throat> another drummer on the show. Uh, a week from today, producer engineer Tom Soares, been involved in a lot of the great, great records that you love. Sunday, November 28th, Mr. David Ellefson, formerly of Megadeth, currently of The Lucid, and much more. And then the often controversial Mark Nickel from MAD Tour Management. Got a lot of cool shows coming up. Don't be scared. Don't be scared. What else? Um, you ready to rock, Jimmy Hazel? You know what? In, in the spirit of Jimmy Hazel, let me just mention to everybody, let me find that flyer. You know, we got, we got a big, we got a big Bowery Electric free Sunday matinee coming up. We are excited. We are welcoming 24-7 Spies to our A7 family. Fahrenheit 451, 24-7 Spies, Cropsy, Iconicide, <clears throat> Sunday, January 16th. If it's free, then it is for me. So get your shoes and socks on, kids. It's right around the corner. It's happening in Sweden, man. I'm keeping my hose in check in Sweden, bro. Um... <laughs> <laughs> what's up scott scott earth silence equals death come on what's going on with this dude hey hey what's going on hey looks like you're uh looks cold out there bro yeah it's it's finally feeling like winter a little bit i'm enjoying it i know right the uh i'm trying to get away from the noise it's like it's every there's like a million airplanes taking off over there listen we all have our crosses I'm, to bear i'm gonna stand bro. here by the grinding equipment <laughs> Danger. Danger. We're grinding over here. Hey, Irwin says greetings from Belgium, by the way. <laughs> right. Oh, man. <sighs> All right. Looking forward to today. We're already having a lot of laughs in the backstage. Oh, listen, you know what? Listen, I want to I wanna make an announcement here to all my patrons out there. Um, we're talking about we are going to, before every show, uh, we do like a, a tailgate thing, a little pre-show thing, and we're going to give it a shot. We're going to have two patrons come into the pre-show um, and, and chop it up with me and Steven and Rap Bones and uh, Sid. So we're going to start getting that. Uh, we're going to start getting that rolling. So, you know, two people per show come hang out with us. Uh, as we get ready for the show, might even be able to talk to our guests for the day. But uh, we're gonna we're gonna get that rolling, huh? No, no holds barred. Why not, right? Yeah. Yep. Hegs, Hegs, you're invited. I think we're gonna. I'm gonna post it up in Patreon. We're gonna do two people per show. You know. Ayo, I think it's anything? a great idea. How come it took us 160 something episodes to think of it? <laughs> I'm fighting for survival here. Hey, yo, Steve, anything graffiti hit up over there? Did you tell me something came into the yard the other day totally tagged up? No. 
Any? Do you hear me? Oh yeah, I hear you now. It's just like I said, it's got a lot of air traffic today. Any graffiti? Any graffiti on the trains over there? No, you know, the guys are slacking. Get me? You know, I haven't seen any. Yet, Always again, lacking, never lacking. <laughs> most of it goes to West Side where they get the big, serious like jobs where they got to clean them off. So. But I'll keep you in mind if I if I see any for sure. No, Tim, I'm not flying you down for a show, but you can come backstage before the show and chop it up with us. Yeah, Ray. Yep. Great ideas take time. Yep. Is this the Iron Maiden episode? No. Well, they're I, all know, Iron Maiden. A episodes. little bit, actually. They're all Iron Maiden episodes. But you know. All right, here we go. Let's do photo of the day. Yeah, wrong let's do it. Wrong answers only, please. This will for sure get me into trouble. Here we go. Wrong answers only, please. Let's see Love what we got here. Is it? <laughs> it's it's not. <laughs> is it Janis Joplin? That's a good one, actually. That's actually pretty. That's very good. Is it Janis Joplin? Is it Janis Joplin Caputo? Very good, Chris. Is it Lita Ford? Is it Alanis Morissette, the Metal Years? <laughs> Is it Taylor Swift? Is it ABBA? Isn't ABBA doing? Isn't ABBA back together and doing something? They just now? put their first album out in forty years. Damn! Somebody needs a, a couple bucks, huh? Is it Bruce? <laughs> Is it My Morning Jacket? Is it Bruce Dickinson? Is it David Lee Roth? Good one. Yes, Abba is back. Is it Slaughter? Close. Yep. There you go. All right. Is it Edie Brickell? I once worked uh, on an Edie. I, I worked on that Edie Brickell video. Oh, which one? You know, I'd have to look it up. Not, not that very first one, but one of the ones off, I worked on. I talked to her like before they blew up. She was cool. Oh, wow. She, she married uh, Paul Simon. And I uh, think they were, weren't they beat? Wasn't she beating him up? Yo, Paul Simon looks like. she was like, beating him. <laughs> listen, Paul Simon got a beating coming, so someone's beating uh, his ass, right? I meant is like it, with kindness. Here's, a, here's another one. There is we it, go. Is it intense mutilation? <laughs> <laughs> there you go. We love this dude. This dude's been on the show. We love this. Oh, yeah. We, we love this guy. This is like, this is a good dude. This is like, he's in our Hall of Fame of good dudes. Is it Mike Gallo? Close. Another good dude. Yep. Is it pig vomit? Good one, Heggs. <laughs> is it what the bass drum says? <laughs> uh, is it Evan Seinfeld in 97? Is it Lemmy? Is it the Lords of Brooklyn? Oh man. All right. One more, one more. And we'll get, we'll get to it. All right. Having a good time today. I, you know, is it okay? Here we go. Here's another, another dude that was on the show who is a big fan favorite here in New York city. Here we go. All right. Right answers only, please. Right answers only, please. Is it Silvio Dante? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is it River Runs Black? All right, right answers only, please. Is it LOA? LOA. 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 <laughs> What's that? Is it the Captain Antonio? Is it Sonny and Cher? Is it Mina? Is it LOA? Is it Mina and Joey? Is it Joey and Mina? <laughs> <laughs> is it life owed agony? We are life owed agony. All right. What is it? Well, though? is it judging by that? Ju judging by that bass drum, I'm guessing we're guessing it's life of agony for sure. <laughs> this is life of agony, and uh, I. Uh, this was the PlayStation Theater uh, back in 2019, and uh, it was an amazing bill. It was Overkill, 
Life of Agony and Death Angel. And uh, this was, uh, this was you know, pre-pandemic, uh, amazing show. In fact, uh, I was inspired uh, for multiple reasons to go with Life of Agony today. One of which is obviously because our guest played this very same show with them with Overkill. And the other reason is that uh, Life of Agony just announced some tour dates uh, with uh, Dog Eat Dog and uh, our friends in Kings Never Die. I got those. And our third reason is we got Veronica coming on next uh, in a couple of days. And we're excited Veronica. about that too. So we, many, many, many branches. This just, this just got announced today, right? Yes, there it is. All right, Life of Agony and Dog Eat Dog and Kings Never Die playing Debonair Music Hall, where both bands just played last week. And <laughs> but no, Life of Agony is the headliner here. Uh, th this tour, I actually know, was in the works for a while. Uh, the pandemic shelved it for about a year. Uh, yeah, man. Yes, looks, John. Looks awesome. They are playing. Yeah, they are playing in, in lovely Teaneck, New Jersey. Yes, I, uh, Thomas, it is 1984 again. All we need to do is get Biohazard on the bill. Yep. It, was it? Was anybody else at the... Hey, Wes, what's up, brother? Never was anyone else at that Life, Life of Agony Dog Eat Dog show in 93 at Lamore, Brooklyn? I didn't see that. I did Two see, nights. I do remember seeing Biohazard, Life of Agony, and Dog Eat Dog maybe out in Jersey. What was that place up the stairs in that ballroom? That place, that place, oh, that place used to go off. Not City Gardens. What was the name of that place? I always forget the name of that place. Not Starland. What was the name of that place in Jersey? You had to go up the stairs. It was like a ballroom. I think it may have been in Newark. What was the name of that place? Oh, someone. I'm thinking Starland it. Ballroom. But no, that's in it wasn't Starland. No, not Starland. Studio Thank One. You. Thank you. Studio One. It was. Yo, I saw some rippers in that fuck. Biohazard used to smush it in that place, man. You know. Well, those, those, bio, those biohazard life of agony typo shows when that whole, like, you know, all the talk about Lords of Brooklyn right there, you know? Yeah, yeah. Those, those, those are, are some tremendous bills. Cool. And, and you, 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 my friend, you got a gig coming up this Friday, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. The Kingsland, your, your favorite place. Dude, I got into a big fight with my girlfriend about this show last Very night. Very psyched about that one. I got into a big fight with my girlfriend uh, 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 oh, about no. this last night. Yep. She pulled some real girlfriend shit on me, man. Like, because I because I, I didn't invite her to the show and just like, wah! Oh my god. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't invite you to the hardcore show, baby. <laughs> I like to go to the hardcore show by myself, so <laughs> I could deal with all the all the 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 the, the horrors of the hardcore show. The, ho yeah. the horror, the horror. Yeah, the man. I caught, now. Yeah, I, caught, I caught grief because of your show, dude, last night. Oh man. And you well, know, this listen. You know what? I mean, uh, it's gonna be awesome. It's I'll be there be with awesome. my girl. I'll be there dragging my girlfriend around, who's probably watching oh, this right cool. now, and it's gonna rip me a new, you know what, when this is over. <laughs> well, hopefully uh, nobody gets hurt. So I, we, need, I mean, we need we need you guys in one piece, you know. Yep. Thanks, Jason. Our guest is sending me stuff as we're, uh, <laughs> you know, talk about multitasking, man. But yeah, listen, and you know, you know, a flyer like this would never go. In my yes. world, just, no more, told no me more that. Marvel Comics characters, and no more friggin' Planet of the Apes. Well, I'm sure that I'm sure we'll see some apes again. I know, I know. <laughs> All right, buddy, you freak! And shut up, you freak! <laughs> All right. All right. I'll All see right. everybody in a little bit then. We'll see. hey. This is the New York Hardcore Chronicles. That, that is awesome, by the this way. This was Look a gift that. from you. You gave me this. Yes, it is. And you know what? It was uh, handmade by my friend's niece, as a matter of fact. Is that right? Yeah. I'm, I'm thankful that your head, it's too, it's, your head is way bigger than yeah. mine. And I have a big head, you know? Yeah. No, it, it looks good. It of... looks, you know what? It, you, you, it, you, it looks way better on you, so. Yep. Yep. Awesome. All right. I'll talk to you in a bit.
And here's a question from RS70. Why are the Jets and the Giants called New York? The Jets should build a stadium on Long Island. Dude, I know, right? Neither team play in New York City or New York. The Buffalo Bills play in New York. That's that's like a new, you want to talk about a New York team? That's the Buffalo Bills. The Jets play in Jersey. The Giants play in Jersey. Yes. Anyway, this is the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live. And we are sponsored by New York Hardcore Comics, The Organic Grill, Chain Reaction Records and Skateboards, DTFM Vinyl Distro, Chacho's Tacos, Generation Records, and, and the Texas Silver Rush is a jewelry design firm and boutique store located in the birthplace of the Texas country music scene in Fredericksburg, Texas. Goddamn electric. They specialize in working with musicians in all music genres to design and create unique one-off pieces, as well as to style them for stage album covers, promo, photos, and social media exposure. Their client list includes Rock and Roll Hall of Famers, Greg Rowley, Ringo Starr, and of course, Agnostic Front. During this current, never-ending pandemic, all information and online sales are being taken at their Facebook and Instagram page, and of course, www.thetexassilverrush.com. Also, come on now, what's up with Vlad? You know him. You love him. It is The Organic Grill. It's a vegan restaurant located in East Village in New York City at what the man? First Avenue, featured in New York Magazine, New York Times, and, believe it or not, incredibly so, Veg News. Their dishes have won numerous awards, including Best Veggie Burger. They make their own cheeses, sausages, and burger patties, and every goddamn dish on the menu can be made gluten-free. For all you gluten-free motherfuckers. This year, they're celebrating their 21st anniversary, and they're all about having a great time while enjoying amazing clean food. They have now fully reopened and look forward to seeing you. Get in touch with them, order some great food at www.theorganicgrill.com. That said, let me see. Every, every, let's bring our guest on. Let me see. Let me see. Here we go. Let me see. Everybody behaving? Hey, Michelle, what's up? How you doing? Um, <laughs> I, I'll get into the book in a little while. Um, everybody else behaving themselves in there. Rick to life hasn't, have an inf, hasn't infiltrated the chat room today. Um, here you go. Here we go. Here we go. Let's clear the deck. Here we go. Here we go. Yo, today's guest is an American drummer and author hailing from upstate New York. He's known for his work with the bands Shadows Fall, Flotsam and Jetsam, Crisis, Toxic, Stigmata, Burning Human, and currently Overkill. Please welcome, coming at us from Albany, the capital of New York State, our old friend, Mr. Jason Bittner. Hey, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm laughing so hard after our prep from last night. <laughs> yeah, you, you know what? I bailed on it. I bailed. Stellar. That was fine. Stellar. I so, bailed on it, bro. Stellar. How are you, How are you my doing? friend? I'm good, buddy. Thanks for coming on. Good. Good. Yeah. So so tell us, what's the latest, man, um, since the zombie apocalypse hit? Uh, you know, give us, a, you know, how's the last year and a half been? Bring us up to date. No, I'm having a little problem with my hand. We played the, uh, we played our first show in 609 days yesterday. And my, uh, my hand's still like a little, a little swollen from... <laughs> I don't know what's wrong with it. It seems, it seems to be a little larger than life. <laughs> this is what I have to say to the last fucking 19 months. <laughs> is that official overkill merchandise? This is official overkill merchandise. This has been, I've had this, I had this as part of my Twitch stream for, well, when I was doing Twitch and I got totally sick and tired of that. So this Twitch can go, go, Fuck itself right. it's, uh, it's in its own in its own right. But this was my favorite thing on Twitch. Everything every time someone would say something I didn't like, I just put the hand up. <laughs> every time someone request a song that I didn't want to play, I was just like, no, <laughs> talk to the hand. <laughs> so Laurent France says Jason hugs from the claw, the French hey, Odin. That's Laurent Bizet, also known as the Spud Monsters Crisis Guitar Tech from nineteen ninety seven. That is probably my, my, hands down, my best friend in France. So my, much, much love to Laurent. Um, this one was from our last tour, also known as the COVID tour, because we were on tour until the world exploded. Right. Uh, and I had to have our merch girl save this for me for the last day because everybody was buying these up. So like I said, 
we just played our first show in 19 months or whatever the hell it was this past mm -hmm. Saturday, and I walked out to the merch table just to see, you know, if we had anything new. <laughs> and there's like five boxes of these, and I'm just sitting there dying. I'm going, Did, those are all going to be gone tonight. Sure as shit, end of the show, went, went to the merch table. Hey, are there any foam fingers left? Oh, fuck no, those were gone. Those are gone before Demolition Hammer was even over with. <laughs> All right, so what's Lots up? Popular what, 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 so items. You, you just played the other night here in New York, right? New Jersey. New Jersey. Excuse me. New Jersey. To me, look, I'm you know you know where I live. I'm an upstate New Yorker. To me, it's the same thing, but to them, it is not the same thing. Right. Right. <laughs> Jersey, get it right, motherfucker. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. And, yeah, and we're Montclair the other bill? night. Overkill. What, what was that bill? Overkill, demolition, hammer, and sworn enemy. Right. Initially, it was supposed to be MOD two when it was nineteen months ago, but you know the reschedule for some reason they were on the bill. But uh, it was it was a great time. It was nice to nice to be back on the horse again. I was starting to forget what that was like. You didn't play out live at all before then. The only thing the only things that I've done since the pandemic started that we our tour got cut two days short. The Jersey show got cut off, and so did the Baltimore show. Mm -hmm. we were sent home the whole pandemic went through the only thing the only times i i actually physically played i went to uh chrome which is a small club here because they were doing a benefit for chrome it was a streaming benefit just to try to keep the club alive because there was a pandemic going and i played with uh one of my old bands china white but it was only like Three, three or four songs. We tried to get Stigmata involved too, but by the time I asked about getting Stigmata involved, there wasn't any, any more space left. So I played three songs like in December of 2019. And then aside from that, the only other time I played live was two Sundays ago, or two uh, two Saturdays ago rather, when I played with Dee Dee with his other band. He has got, he's got like a, you know, a swing rockabilly band and we played in Jersey two weeks ago. But that was my first real show since then wow and what's and and what isn't there some isn't there some hot news didn't didn't you guys just uh with one of the bands isn't something going on giant reunion december 18th shadows yeah. fall finally yeah huh <laughs> we had to postpone it two years in a row we had uh we had the date set for for 2019 no we had it set for 2020 before the pandemic started and then, you know, by time by time the summer of, of 2020 rolled around, they they pulled the plug and they just said, you know, John Peters and the Palladium were, were nice enough to hold the date another full year in hopes that we'd be able to do it this year. So as soon as, you know, we got the clearance from Anthrax and Overkill that John and I would be available, we're like, yep, we can do it. So. How, how fucked up is that? It's like you finally decide to do a reunion and you have to wait like two right. years to get it done, man. Well, sadly, last last year we were joking. We are like, maybe this is someone telling us to not fucking do this show, you know? <laughs> <laughs> maybe the powers that be don't want Shadows Fall to get back together. But I was like, oh, well, it's like, nah, this is this is screwing up everybody's world. So let's... Uh... <laughs> and and that's and that's the right venue to do it. That's where they they used to have the big the metal fast and like yep. I, I'm sure you pro yep. you probably played that room you know 20 25 times quite a few years. times quite a few yeah. times over the course of the band. Yep, I yeah. played there a bunch like with with Shadows Fall a bunch with Stigmata a few times with Burning Human we played a metal fest there with Overkill I've played there. Yep. Uh, I didn't play there with Flotsam, but um, yep. But yep. I saw. I saw the Jerry Garcia band play there when it was the, the Lowe's Orpheum in 1981. Woo! <laughs> wow. Crazy. Um, so tell us, how did you come up? Did you grow up in a musical household? Were you part of a musical family? Nope. I was the first one. Uh, I really don't know where it came from because uh, nobody, nobody in my family before me, aside from on either side, my father's or my mother's was, was any mute musician, artist. I'm like, as far as I know, I'm the first ever wow. in the arts field. Um, but since then, like when my dad got remarried and had my, uh, my younger brother and sister, 
Uh, my brother dabbled in drums for a little while, and my sister actually plays piano and is a, and is a really good singer. So I just kind of guess I, I must have started everything. Uh, you know, I was just banging on pots and pans when I was a kid. You know, Kiss made me want to be in a band. Uh, and I just, you know, I had toy drum sets, you know, all that crap. Like when, when I was a kid, three, four, five, six years old, when I finally could take lessons in school, which was... Uh, third grade for drums. For some reason, you could start any other instrument, like woodwinds, vi violin, all the strings, and second grade. But for our school system, drum wasn't, drums wasn't, wasn't until third grade. So that's did, did, you, did your parents support you? Like, because like when I was a young kid, I asked my dad for drums, and it got shut down. Did your parents support you when you said, I want to did. My parents, my parents, they did. But this is kind of funny, because my, my parents split when I was young. My parents split when I was between, you know, eight and 10 which is right when I started playing drums. And, and um, even though my dad still lived close by, it wasn't like, you know, I didn't have any contact with my dad, but he, I didn't live with my dad. I lived with my mom and I went weekends with my dad, but he was still close by. My dad bought me my first drum set, which now in hindsight, ha ha ha, I don't have to listen to it. <laughs> my ex-wife has to listen to it. So sadly, my mother put up with that, God rest her soul for all those years. But they were both they were both supportive. Like I said, you know, my dad's the one who bought me the first kit. He built me uh, a rubber practice pad kit. Like even when I was a kid, because that's what my teacher had, and he was like, and he was he was a you know he was a carpenter for all his life, and he was like, I can build that thing. He's like that they want five hundred bucks for that. He's like I can build that with fifty dollars worth awesome. of material. And he built the same damn thing that my drum teacher had. That's so awesome. they were they were both supportive, and and my mother to this day, you know. My mother had to listen to every single stigmata practice because it was right here in the same house when she was alive. So <laughs> they were both very supportive. Yeah, that's, you know, my dad tells me, he's told me in the, like recently that he regrets, he regrets not um, letting me follow my passion when I was a kid because I was really into drumming and they, they, you know, it, you know, he says he regrets not letting me sort of, I had a passion for something as a child and, yeah. you know, but, but, you know, things worked out for the most I, part, but I think my dad was okay with it. I mean, I know he wanted me to play sports. I mean, I tried to play baseball. My dad, I wanted to be a ball player. You know, that's what he wanted to do when he was a kid and he uh -huh. got, you know, he was, he was a pretty good baseball player, but I could never, you know, I could never, you know, couldn't hit the fastball. So, yeah, you know, right. I, I, I tried for him, but like, you know, I did the whole little league thing. But by the time I got to Babe Ruth, I'm like, all right, I'm done. You know, I'm 15. I got a BMX bike. I'm racing bikes. You know, I'm I'm learning how to play, you know, YYZ from Rush. I got more to worry about than the stupid fastball. <laughs> yeah. And, and when you get up to Babe Ruth and you can hit the fastball, yeah, that's kind of it, man. That's, that's, the, that's the sign. Yeah, this, is, is. this is what I was. Throw Bittner out in left field. When the, when, the, when the team is winning, put him in the fifth inning and let him play seventh. Sixth, seventh, and eighth inning in right field. Hopefully, no one's going to hit the ball to him, right. and maybe he'll bat once. And maybe if he gets lucky, he'll put his hip into the way and he'll get hit by the pitch. <laughs> but so, if you put a set of drums in front of me, motherfucker, I'll play circles around everyone at this ball field. <laughs> so, who just throw a couple names out there when you were when you were a young person? Who, who were the big drum influences that inspired you as a very young person? Keith Moon, John Bonham, Stuart Copeland. Okay, now. Okay. Is Keith Stuart Moon is Copeland, the first. Is Stuart, Stuart Copeland's a lefty, right? No. No? Phil Collins is a lefty. Who's a lefty? Phil Collins. Ah, right. Got it. Keith Moon was the first guy that made me actually, like, pay attention to drums because my dad was a huge Two fan. So right. I heard who's next all the time and won't get fooled again. I was like, this guy's killing the drums. I just thought it was just so cool. Yeah. So that was my, my first thing with that. And then um, I, I heard Led Zeppelin at a real young age. And it was just something about Bonzo's drums and his, the sound of his drums. That, that's what, what made me gravitate to that. Because no one, to, to my young ears, nobody had hit the drums like that guy was hit. The way the same, that guy was hitting the drums. So yeah. that was number two influence. And then as soon as MTV hit, even though I saw Iron Maiden the first day, it still took a few years before that kind of influence came into my drumming. I was huge into the police because you couldn't you couldn't have MTV on and literally not see one of the videos from uh, the 
Ghost in the Machine album like every yeah. two minutes on there. Sure, for sure. So, Absolutely. They were so used. much that I have a you know Midnight Blue Stewart Copeland replica drum set downstairs in my basement. Got it. Got it. And a now, Bonzo in a Bonzo Vista like kit and two Neil Parrott kits too. Are you a hoarder of drum kits? Can, is there I sort of am. I I real I really does am. Does such thing exist to, like for drums? Yes. Like yeah. Yes. And and two of the most guilty parties are me and John Tempesta. Uh where both of us are very bad. <laughs> we got, we compare there was one day that we were and Charlie Benante tells us this all the time. He's like, You two have fucking serious problems. Like <laughs> he's like, I've got like two drum sets and like three snare drums and, and me and John are sending lists of like forty, fifty snare drums. I think <laughs> I think he has he has more physical snare drums than I do, but I think I have more kits than he does. It's it's ridiculous. But in the last in the last few years, I have to admit I've bought a lot of shit online because in the last few years, sadly, some of this stuff is better than than investing in the stock market. I know what's rare. I know what I can get. If I know if I can buy something for three hundred dollars and flip it for a thousand, I'm gonna buy it. It's gonna sit there. But I know that I can sell this and I'm going to wait, make my money back on it. And sadly, there's been people who, you know, selling off their stuff, you know, yeah. either that or they have a lot of stuff to sell it to pay their bills or whatnot. And not that I've got money to burn to go be buying drums or anything like that. But for the, the year that I was getting unemployment with the pandemic money, like something eBay would come along. I'm like, well, dude, I'll take that. Well, you know? also, also, you live, you're in upstate New York. You know, I'm down here. In, in, in a studio apartment in New York City, you have the room for it up there. So why not? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yep. Hey, did you, did you, um, you went to Berkeley College of Music, correct? Yep. Did you tell us about that? Did you graduate or how did that pan out? No, I went there. I went there and did what a lot of people do when they go to Berkeley and that's go there. Well, at least maybe not now, but at least back in my day, like back in the, in the 80s when I was there, 80, you know, 88, 89, a lot of people went there to go network with people, meet people and start a band and then leave. And, you know, I, that's exactly what I did. I, 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 I went along the same lines as, you know, some of my friends, some of my good friends who went there, Mike Portnoy, he was there two years ahead of me. He was there at 85, 86, met Petrucci, met John Myung, formed Dream Theater, left. Formed Dream Theater, went back to Long Island. The next year, Todd Zuckerman from Styx, he was there 86, 87, was there for a year, got experience, went back to Chicago, started playing out. I was there the next year, 88 to 89, met some dudes, left, was going to start gonna start a band, stayed there for a year, learned how to play some different styles of music, left and, and went and did my thing. I wanted to play in, in a band. Berkeley yeah. can't teach you how to be in a band. Berkeley can teach you a lot about music, but Berkeley's not going to teach you how to get in a van with four other guys and travel around the world. It's just not. Sure. You have to go out there and do it. Right. So, right. so speaking, speaking of, that, of that, let's talk let's about, about stigma. Yeah. <laughs> Outside Dan Walsh's apartment. <laughs> <laughs> Great. When Mike had blonde hair, that's prob that's probably the first stigma uh, press photo that I'm in with my bangs. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. I still wish I had that fucking jacket, man. That was the coolest. I, that fucking that the jacket I'm wearing is is an embroidered like Dickies light jacket, and Mike had like the only one, and I liked it so much. And he let me like after I begged him all the time, I'm like, well, just get one made for me. He finally gave me his gave me the jacket. Hey, <laughs> look, he's chiming in. Look, he's chiming in. Oh God, because he knows how ridiculous he looks with that blonde hair, don't you, Mike? Call a motherfucker once, will you? Oh, Jesus, God. I missed you there, pal. All right, so anyways. Yo, Riley, looks hard. Riley looks hard in this photo. He certainly does. <laughs> so how did, this, how, did this, how did this come to be? How, how did you end up in Stigmata? I ended up in Stigmata because Dan and I were going to music school together. Dan and I were going to SCC together. And uh, wow. Mike, Mike, hold on. Hey, man. Well, you know, we went to California and we recorded an EP, man. <laughs> Dan couldn't go five minutes without tugging on his beard. So, so I knew Dan. I knew Dan from SCC, uh, Schenectady County Community College. We were going to music school together, and uh, I obviously knew the guys in Stigmata because we just played in the same scene. Now Mike can laugh because now I'm the asshole with the fake blonde hair. 
<laughs> ah! <laughs> Hold on, I'll give you a second. Yeah. <laughs> yep. That's that's me with my my best Billy from Biohazard impersonation right there. <laughs> yeah, Jay, Jay, Jay. Now this is a little bit later because that, is that yeah, that's buddy? Just, is that that's, that's the one to others. Period. Yeah. That's right before Mike Mike left to go uh, tattoo in New York. Right. Oh wait, no, duh. That's after he came. No, it's after he came back. Is do unto others. Right. That's because he came back. <laughs> I definitely don't miss that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 That's right. That's after he came back. That's when we did do unto others, and when we did the uh, we did our European tour, and uh, mm -hmm. and then we called it a day. Now I, I have a, another. Here's another stigmata photo, and 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 I'm putting this. I'm putting this up for the reason that the club that it's taken in, which which <laughs> I, which I remember very well. And do, do you recognize this place? Yeah, of course I do. I spent half my adult life there, and I, yeah. I opened up for the band I'm currently in there. I opened up for the band I was in before that there. Uh, Shadows Fall, we played there quite a bunch. Yeah, it's Saratoga Winners. And ironically, there's a giant banner that hangs outside my studio from October 9th, 2010. It's a giant banner of Shadows Fall. We were headlining in the Philippines the same day that fucking Winners was burning down because everybody and their brother was texting me. And that's back in the day where, like, when you got a text message, it still costs money. And I'd be like, oh, God damn it, because everybody stopped fucking telling me this place is burning down. I'm in the fucking Philippines. It's a buck every time my phone goes ding. <laughs> Sarah, so what, what was the guy? What was the, the, the two brothers owned it, right? So I'm in Jabbar. And this also proves something, too. Mike, you're going to fucking get a kick out of this. Who is the asshole who's on the fucking other microphone? Because it's nobody in the fucking band. If you're not in the band, get the fuck off the stage. It's Sean Jesus Dixon. Christ. It's Some idiot. Ah! And you know, half the time when the idiot would grab the fucking mic, they sing the fucking lyrics in the wrong spot, and then I hear it through the monitor, and then I fuck up. Here's uh here's Sorry, the <laughs> nerve with that one. Involved in. you, remember this? you remember this? Of course I do. I yeah. was just thinking about the original Marauder the other day because I was listening to uh uh Master Killer on the way home from Jersey the other day. I was like, great. man, this it's fucking great. record was so great and this it's band just great. fell apart right after it. Yeah, it's 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 a shame, but And then yeah, I learned I learned a very valuable story a number of years later. Here's a fun fact for you. Mm -hmm. My good friend Robert Kampf, who used to own Century Media Records, you want to know why Century Media, why Century Media did not sign Stigmata in 1995? Because of the Marauder debacle. <laughs> Robert told me that in 1995 it was a toss-up between they were going to sign either Marauder or Stigmata. It wasn't two; it was one or the other. And they chose Marauder, he said, because he thought they seemed like a more stable band. <laughs> well, in hindsight, this is what happened. He picked the band that fell apart after they fucking made one great record. And the reason why our band fell apart after we made an equally as fucking good record, Hymns for an Unknown God, still one of my favorite records I've ever been a part of. As soon as we made that record and couldn't get a deal, that's when we fell apart. That's when Mike finally said, fuck it, I'm leaving. I need to make a living. He moved to fucking New York, set up the tattoo shop like any smart person would, and we fell apart. How ironic. I found that out when I became a member of Shadows Fall my first time in <laughs> Central <Sent your> Media. <laughs> um, I found that out the first time I met Robert when I was, when I was a member of Shadows Fall because he brought it up. Yeah. I was like, wow, I didn't know that. And I was like, well, I guess that's cool. We almost got signed, but almost doesn't mean shit. <laughs> Hang, horseshoes and hand grenades, right? Right. Um, so you were you 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 definitely did your time in the trenches with Stigmata. Seven years, three albums, Saratoga and Saratoga winners. That 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 whole that whole circuit. I mean, was there? Was there any point in that stretch where you where you sort of felt like you were drifting at sea? Oh, a lot of it. I mean, probably the whole do unto others phase was just. I mean, probably in my head, I was like, "Yeah, we're gonna make another record," and I and I I hope this is gonna do something. But 
you know, first of all, Mike wasn't in the band anymore. So, I mean, yeah, he came back. But, I mean, at that point, you know, we were in our, our late 20s going into our 30s. And, you know, I was just starting to work for the state. I wasn't going to just leave a good job to go sure. fucking do four dates on the East Coast or some yeah. bullshit. Or mm -hmm. let's go, we're going to go to Europe on, let's be the, the three band on a fucking five band bill. It's like not even going to Europe to headline. You're like, you're going there just to say you, you went there. And I did that. I did that in crisis. We did it with stigmata. And after we did it again, and we were, I'm glad that we were able to do the last European tour that we did as an actual band mm -hmm. when, when it was. Well, most of us, fortunately, unfortunately, Buddy couldn't go with us, and we had a fill-in bass player. But it was still me, Jay, and Mike, and Bob, and we had a really fun time on that on that that tour. We did. I mean, we we're in a van and stuff, but we kind of knew it was like the last hurrah, so we just made the best of it. You know, playing in Czech Republic for five fucking people. There wasn't <laughs> even they, they didn't even they didn't even fucking have gear for us. They, we had like these practice amps and Bob sang through like a combo amp. There weren't any mics on the drums. It was such, it was so ridiculous, but it's hysterical. So by the time I got asked to join Shadows Fall, my, my initial reaction was, are you fucking kidding me? I don't want to be in a band. Like, right. <laughs> I just, no, because we just, we had just gone through all this shit and we realized that after all these years, this was done. We weren't getting any farther you know, it ran its course. It did what it, it did. And now it's time to move on. So I was working full time for the state, you know, within literally this. It happened like this. Shadows fall called. We had just come down and jam with us. Ah, I don't no, I don't no, want to no, be. No, in no, a, let me ask you. Man. Let me ask you. Let me ask you. The, the shadows the fall connection. connection. Is that is, is, that, is, that, is that an upstate, upstate connection? connection? There's a giant connection. Wait till I tell you this story. This is going to blow your fucking mind. Mm -hmm. With the with the amount of people that I can rope into this that are in all famous big bands at this point right now, okay? Mm -hmm. I'm gonna tell you a story how Shadows Fall will connect with I'm gonna I have to do this because this is the amount of bands. <clears throat> Shadows Fall, push button warfare, o overcast. Uh aftershock, kill switch engage, all that remains. Candiria, uh, hold on, I'm still thinking, still thinking of the other, uh, I said all the remains, right? I said that, uh, uh, Lamb of God, Mastodon. Okay, nine bands are going to all circle from this. Shadows Fall used to play shows with Overcast. Anybody know who was in Overcast? Brian Fair from Shadows Fall, Mike D from Kill Switch Engage. Okay, mm -hmm. that's the first connection with this band. Out of Shadows Fall came Burning Human with me and Jay and some of and and Jay Vandervoort and Jonah who you were basically like guys who used to help us with our gear. Burning Human used to play shows with Push Button Warfare, a band from Massachusetts that contained Paul Romanko, the bass player from Shadows Fall, and Zeus, the producer. Yes, the guy that produced all the Shadows Fall records and the guy that pretty much is Rob Zombie's personal producer right now. They were both in that band. Wow. Okay. I left Stigmata to go to Crisis. Oh, I left out Spud Monsters and Biohazard too. Forgot them too. Who then went on the first European tour with the Spud Monsters with Scott Roberts, who would then join Biohazard later on. Blah, 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 blah. In that time, I tried out for propane. They didn't take me. They took Dave Shivari because they knew him better. In that period too, in 1995, I was supposed to try out for Machine Head too. They didn't take me because they knew Dave McLean. Yes, Rob Flynn will back that story up. This is all 1995. We haven't even got to 96, 97. So I joined, I joined Crisis. I do a year of Crisis. I come back. I do Burning Human and Stigmata again. Stigmata finally does its thing. One of the last shows we played was opening for Shadows Fall at Pearl Street for the Of One Blood CD release party. Now, at that point, Shadows Fall was Brian on vocals, John and Matt playing guitar, Paul on bass, and David Germain was the drummer. Stigmata was the opening, was the was a direct support band. I remember, so now I go, oh, Shadows Fall, I remember this band. This is this is that band that Scott Lee told me about, and this is the, they, they got a different singer. I'm, I'm like, that's the guy who, was in, who used to be in Overcast. 
But when I saw Shadows Fall the first time, they didn't have that guy sing, and they had this other guy. The other guy was Phil, who mm -hmm. later became in All the Remains, performed All the Remains. So a year before this show, like the la some of my last shows at with Crisis, this is where the story really gets funny. Crisis plays a show at the Espresso Bar in Worcester, Massachusetts. Okay? The Espresso, Espresso Bar, huh? Bar, huh? Yep. In Worcester, Massachusetts. Is, 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 is there a second? Do you have a second, have device, a second open device open over there? Over there your phone, phone or something? Nope. It's weird. weird. Echo. Echo. Let me check the audio, but to my knowledge. All right. All right. We'll, we'll go with it. I have Echo cancellation on. Even. All, right. All right. No problem. <clears throat> so... Come back. Oh, yeah, yeah, hold on. <laughs> All right. It's a good thing I know how to stream. Uh, <laughs> so Crisis plays a show at the Espresso Bar. The opening band was Shadows Fall with Phil singing. I never realized this when I played the show because we were headlining, and I was either in the van probably. I was probably in the van warming up in my practice pad because there was nowhere else to go. I only found this out like literally like recently, like within the last few few months, I was talking to Zali. He goes, you know that Shadows Fall was the opening band with one of those times we played the Espresso Bar? I went, bullshit. He goes, yeah. I go, really? So I, then I go down this wormhole of the Espresso Bar and I find all these old poster, uh, all these old ads on, on online, right? So lo and behold, I pull up a show that's Crisis and the headlining band is Overcast. And I'm talking to Scott Lee a few weeks ago, because we're talking about, it is, this is a total history lesson. So we're talking about the Shadows Fall show. And I go, hey, I, got, I just got this video. It's, it's, it's Crisis. Remember when you booked Crisis at the Espresso Bar when we were open for Overcast? He goes, dude, he goes, you know what else happened that night? I go, no. He goes, John and Matt and Paul were there too. I go, what? He goes, yeah, because that's the night that they came to ask Brian to be in Shadows Fall. I go, so you're telling me on this night, that the core five members that everybody knows from Shadows Fall was in the same building. He goes, you're all in the same fucking room. I go, that's fucking crazy. And he goes, and you know who else was there that night? And Avzal put the icing on the cake. He goes, you know who else was there that night? I go, who? He goes, Braun and Bill from Mastodon. I go, what are you talking about? He goes, they were in Today's the Day, and they came up to see us play just to hang out. I went, you're fucking kidding me. So wow. these guys that... You know, like Shadows Fall and Mastodon toured together so many times, and we had such great times with those guys. And I'm like, wow, I always thought that the first time I met those guys was 2002 at South by Southwest when I was in Shadows Fall. But, you know, I guess I didn't. <laughs> so, so, you, so you joined Shadows Fall, and did, did, did that roller coaster ride start right away, like as soon yep. as you joined? Yep. My, my mom passed away in, in, in August of 2000. Uh, 21 or 2001. No, 2002. I'm, I, no, 2001. I'm sorry. I can't keep my years together anymore with this fucking pandemic. It was 20 years this year. My mom passed away in 2001 in August. The last Stigmata show was Black Friday, November of 2001. My first show with Shadows Fall was December 27th, 2021. I was literally live with Shadows Fall six weeks later. Before I could even get out of Stigmata, I was already in Shadows Fall when I said I wasn't going to join another band. But when I went, they they asked me. I said no. I said I wasn't interested in trying out. This is like about a month prior to the last Stigmata show. I said, my mom just died. My head's not there. I, I got a good job. I You know, 31, I'm done. And then five weeks later, they called again. They're like, well, you know, would it just hurt to just come down and jam? Because in that time, they thought they had a drummer. Here's another interesting twist and turn. Derek Kurzweil from Seamless was filling in, but at the time, they were still auditioning other guys. One of the other guys they auditioned was the guy I sent you of the picture of earlier where you said, who is this guy? And I went, how does Drew not recognize this guy of all dudes? It was Matty Byrne from Hatebreed. He got the job, and he was going to join, but then Jamie called him to join Hatebreed, so he took the Hatebreed job. So then, once again, Shadows Fall had no guy. They called me again. That's you know, us, you know, in, that's us guys, in 2002. You guys have no hair. <laughs> I know. That's because I was growing mine back out, and Matt just shaves his. Yeah. And he always has a hat on. But that was that was like Shadows Fall, Hatebreed, Six Feet Under, 2002. Wow. <laughs> the Rise of Brutality Tour. 
That's in uh, that's in Allentown or State College, Pennsylvania. That dressing room. The reason why I remember that is that dressing room. Everything in that dressing room, the th the theme is ham. So everybody just writes everything and they put ham in it. So if you're you're tagging your band, we would be Hamada or Steak Ham, <laughs> Burning Ham, you know, Shadows Shadow Ham. ham. So of course, Hate Breed was Ham Breed. So. Yeah. Wow. So anyways, they thought they were going to have Matty Byrne, but then he decided to say no and join Hatebreed. So they called me again. I went down. I played the first first five tunes off the, that record with those guys, and I never left. And I saw a shooting star on the way home, and then I was convinced that it was my mother telling me that this is my last shot at this, so take it. Good for you, buddy. That was that's it. All, that, that's awesome. And this is the and this is the record that you that, and this is the first re Shadows Fall record that you play on, correct? Yep, I recorded that record maybe two months after joining the band. Like literally, I joined the band so they would be able to do a six-week tour with Kitty in Europe because they'd never gone to Europe before. But I'd gone to Europe ah. numerous times with Crisis and, and Stigmata. So, but I said for you guys, it's crucial because you want to, you know, you want to get your band name spread to you know overseas. So. The initial idea was I was just going to take the time off from work and just fill in and do the tour with them. But I changed my mind that they were leaving. <laughs> I literally I literally was going to wait to the end of the tour before I made any decision. And after we had like two beers in the bar next to our manager's place, I was like, ah, fuck it. I'll be in the band one last time, whatever. What could happen? <laughs> Thank God I did. <laughs> that's, that's great. Um, now, this, where am I? What's what's the what's the record I'm looking for? Yeah, the War Within. That's, um, that's this, the next one. That's the next one, and this one really—that's the um, one that made me basically. Yeah, and this and there was a song off this that was nominated for a Grammy. Uh, th this record really put Shadows Fall on the map. Tell us about it. It did. Um, this is this is the record, The Art of Balance. See, the band the band was already was made a, a a small a small dent in the metal world with of one blood so they had already had a they already had a lot of u.s touring behind them and they were starting to make a a a, a splash here like all these bands them god forbid unearth lamb of god kill switch they were all in the infancy stages you know we were all just baby bands at that time um probably the biggest band out of that uh, out of all of us at that point was was hate breed I and mean, if you really look at it on on a, on a on a level they were still the biggest one out of out of all of us because we were all opening for them or we were all vying to open open for hate breed and they were still trying to cross over more into metal with their tours as much as they could so they could expand their audience too which is smart because you know it as well as i do from all the years that we've known josta he's a businessman he's a fucking smart man so Art of Balance is really the record that started giving us more of a of a, a presence in the metal world. And that's when we did OzFest 2003. And that was relentless touring. It was tour, tour, tour. We would come home for fucking two days and we'd go out for another nine weeks. I was barely home between 2002 and 2003. Like we were just constantly touring. But it built our following and it built our fan base. Us and Killswitch were the biggest selling artists on the second stage of OzFest for the whole entire fucking tour. There was no other band that sold more records than we did. Cradle was the headliner, but they weren't selling more than us or Killswitch. We were both neck and neck with Killswitch every every week. It was either one of us that was, you know, number one or number two. So we had a lot of momentum going into into doing the War Within. We had skeletons of the song for the from from some of the songs for the War Within while we were on that Ozfest tour, but we weren't trying to write because we were just the, that tour was so busy and we were caught up in the fucking just the just the the nuttiness of that tour and being on an Ozfest and taking it all in ourselves and just fucking having a fucking blast because that's what it was. We had a blast every day of that fucking tour. It was just, it was amazing. The stories I have just from that first one alone. And we were lucky enough to go back and do it as a headliner later. So we had a lot of momentum. We knew this record needed to be the best possible thing that we could put out. So when we went home, we really honed the ball on this record. We, 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 we didn't just write a song. We'd write it. We'd revise it. We'd revise it. We'd take it home. Is it done yet? No, let's try doing it with this. Let's, let's switch this part. Let's do that. Let's just change this around. So we did a lot of pre-production for The War Within. And at that and point, we were... Isn't, isn't that the record that didn't Zeus produce that? Zeus produced every record we had. 
yeah. for the most part, except for Threads of Life. That's the only one he didn't produce. But yes, he did. Um, he did Of One Blood, he did Out of Balance, and now he's on where we're within where, where we are right now. Got it. So, so we at that point, we didn't have a rehearsal room yet. We were still rehearsing between John's parents' house and, and my basement. So we once a week, I'd drive out to Massachusetts, and once a week, they'd drive here. So we were still, you know, we rehearse, and we just, we flip-flopped every other practice. We tried to practice three times a week. So whoever, you know, one week I'd have to drive twice a week, one week they'd have to drive twice a week. So whatever. But we put the time in and we split it up so it wouldn't be so monotonous and it always just be me driving out there. So we really worked hard at these songs. We did pre-production. We recorded everything first. We sat back and listened to it. We let the label hear. Is there anything, everybody liked everything? Okay, now let's get this done. We went in, we recorded it for real. I put a lot of time into my tracks. I wanted to make sure everything was as perfect. I could, Well, not perfect, because nothing's <laughs> perfect. But as good as I could possibly make it. I knew this was going to be my pinnacle, and that's, that's what I wanted. So I never knew. When I was making that album, I never had any idea the inkling of, of the impact it was going to make at that point in metal. Um, I mean, it was a big album for us. It was our first Grammy nomination. Uh, it's almost a gold record still to this day. It's still not gold yet. It's like 450, something like that. And gold is 500,000. Right, right yeah, it's right there. And you know, it'll go gold when we're all fucking dead, but whatever it's close. No, 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 no it'll, it'll go, go gold, gold now that you guys, guys are getting back, back together to play a, play a show. show. Well, you never know. People still don't buy albums, but still <laughs> my point was, if this was back in the day, it would have been gold. But anyways, uh, I have a, I have a half gold plaque that sent century media made for us. <laughs> So anyways, um, it was it, it sold a lot of records. Guitar Hero took the light that blinds, and that was just like a giant song for us because it was in Guitar Hero. So all the kids knew that song, so that was a giant song for us. Really helped in that song. There's a lot of drums going on in that song. That year, that was the second year that I won number one metal drummer. That was the second, uh, no, it was the first year I won number one metal drummer. And I won two years in a row. I won 2005 and 2006 with the Modern Drummer Readers Award. Did you win Award. best recorded performance? Off the uh, record? That's what I'm getting to. But yeah. even though that's that's awesome to win number one metal drummer, like that's you know your peers and fans voting you, you know that they think that your stuff's really cool at that point. Oh, it's just a popularity contest. Doesn't mean I'm the best drummer in metal. Just right. means that some of those people think at that point. But to, time, but to get recognized by your peers. But right, exactly. But like I said, the medal, the medal award was great. But the best recorded performance, that one is that's the one for me. And that's and cool. and that's exactly what Mike Portnoy said to me because when I won, Mike called me up because I'm I'm really good friends with Mike and I've I've looked to Mike a lot of times over the course of my my career for for advice and stuff on various things. And he and he just he called me after that. He goes, dude. He goes, I think it's awesome that you won number one medal because you deserve that. But Best recorded performance. He goes, that's a fucking, that's a, that's the top one, man. He goes, that means that the that other people are listening to you yeah. too. He goes, so be proud of that one. And I was like, that's I awesome. am, and, awesome. and that was that was cool. And and then then we cool. continued on with that was our record that got us our first Grammy nomination. So cool. Hey, it was, um, let it was me a great time. Uh, let me shout out some sponsors. Let's take a minute. Uh, let me do a couple things. If uh, if you got to, uh, you know, go get something to eat or go to the bathroom, and we'll, we will continue in about 10 minutes, okay? Mm -hmm. Well, there you have it. This is the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live, and our guest today is our old friend Jason Bittner from Shadows Fall, Overkill, Stigmata, Flotsam and Jetsam. We are sponsored by a couple of people, including Generation Records. Since 1992, Generation Records has been a mainstay of the New York metropolitan area music scene. Today, they offer a diverse selection of new and used rock, jazz, indie, hip-hop, punk, hardcore, metal, blues, soundtrack, and reggae LPs, as well as T-shirts, posters, and other merchandise. They buy used record collections and music memorabilia and will pay you top dollar for them. House calls made for large collections in the tri-state area. Call or email generationrecords at gmail.com and follow them on Facebook and on Instagram. Also, lest we forget, DTFM Vinyl Distro is a record store that specializes in underground music, not above ground but underground punk ska hardcore metal and more located in the heart of fargo north dakota's industrial district where it's probably friggin freezing right now 
Shop in person or online at www.dtfenvinyldistro.com, where the motto is death to false metal. Yeah, listen, I know what you're thinking right now. I'm thinking the same thing. What about this dude? Yo, what, up? What, up? what up, everybody? I was all set up before, and then you got so excited for your guests, you kind of. But let's uh, bridge it. I have a really good bridge. It's all bridge hard it. Metal. It's Take all it to what I bridge. got, you know. Go ahead. Uh, I want to start. I always start off with the biggest thing last, and I'm going to do the coolest thing first today. I just got this sheet of uh, wacky pack stickers, bro. It's pretty cool to get them, you know, some faves on there. And this is series one uncut sheet, right? Wow. Dude, Super I used cool. to love those things, yeah. man. Dude, I let me, hold on. Let me look. Let me see. Yeah, camels, girl, girl, yeah, crust toothpaste, dampers. Dude, th those that, that's the classic series yeah, right there. Yeah, look at this one. Dutch boy. Bit, bit. I yeah, bit of money. Yeah, that's cool. And when you get the uncut card, it's got the back, the puzzles on it, you know, and the, the yep. theory sheets. So you yeah, score that. That's why I love the city. You know, you score these weird little things. But, uh, you know, I want to just say uh, we had such a good time up at uh, Dobbs Ferry. Shout out to New York Hardcore Comics. You know, we went up there. I just want to show a couple things I got. They just got a fresh batch of tapes in, and I scored – some metal tapes, some scorpions in trance. Great record. One hey, of my I, 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 uh, thank uh, you for uh, thank you for playing the Drew Stone role, dude. I was holding it down for you. Thank you, bro. That was Yo, a great was event. Yes, you know, I mean, comic book stores are a cool place. You know, we had a lot yep. of fun. And uh, th this other is one of my favorite Scorpions records of all time. It's a little hippie ish, but. That's What's like that? which one is that? Fly to the rainbow. I don't know that one. Oh, this is right after Lonesome Crow. This is like when they were at the pinnacle to me. It's kind of like Judas Priest said, "Wins his destiny." Like that record's kind of hippie-ish, but it's so cool. And then I got this classic banger. Yeah, on from cassette. Ali and Debo up at Dobbs Ferry, New York Hardcore Comics. Thank you guys. And then the banger of that whole, like when this tape was out. Everybody had the yellow tape, and I seen a red one in other people's collection. But I think that the green one was, you know, we used to call the yellow one the banana tape, right? The banana bag, put the banana bad brains in. I had a yellow one, yeah, the banana tape. And then, uh, I just want to show a couple. Oh, one other thing when I go to a comic book store, I always do this one move where I'm like, Where's the cheap dollar bin? because you dig in the bottom, and uh. For only five bucks, I got me a, a Return of the Jedi, Garimian Guard. You know, for five bucks, that's a steal. He doesn't have Hey, a what's that Godzilla thing behind you? Oh, yeah. Let me thank uh, Stephen Messina, my homeboy. We had such a good time bringing each other the gifts and whatnot, right? Killer shirt he gave me. Killer Godzilla versus Ghidra. With wow, the that's, that, that's pretty cool. There. I ain't mad at that, right? Yo, Mothra, the whole gang is on that thing. Super killer, bro. Super killer. Yep. Oh. Cool. That's all right. All right. And then I just want to give one last shout out out the door to my man at Clockwork Records. We stopped by there. Thank hey, you. Hey, did you find man. something in one of those cassettes? Oh, you know what? I have a cassette, you know. I think the, I think you'll appreciate these couple of sets too. I had these ready. Oh yeah, Let's bro! Hear. Come on now, right? Oh, yeah, Phil and Kaivano, then, uh, we had him on the one, show. You know, I got this crate. I don't know what's really good. I don't know every single band out there, but then I seen someone else posting that they had a bunch of this band's records and the demo, right? Bone Crusher demo from '90. Mm -hmm. And then this weird, I had this one in uh, in this Angry Youth demo. There was this uh, 
you know, sometimes you find wacky stuff when you're a young teenager, right? You hid stuff in the cassette, and I found this. I don't know if we should, you know, we're kind of dry snitching on ourselves right now. But this was in there. It looks like a brown hit of acid to me. Is that a hit of acid? <laughs> yeah, man. And, and cigarettes were only two ten a pack because it's in the cigarettes. Oh, it was in that thing. wrapper? Yeah. Dude. Don't eat the brown acid, bro. Yeah, that's funny. We were just talking about that. Imagine that. Imagine if you if you took that. It's probably thirty years old. You probably like go insane oh, and like I, you know, kill your wife it. and kid. Don't it. take it, bro. All right. So I do got to give the shout out. I got to get some Iron Maiden in on the show before we go. I did mm. buy a first pressing of the Iron Maiden's first record up at uh, Clockwork Records from my man Mike. You know, we had a great right. weekend and uh. Got some cool shit, and that was the collectible of the day, folks. All right, and, uh, buddy. Well Jason's done. Great, man. Jason's a real live wire, man. Keep it going, you know? Thank you, buddy. Keep I'll talk to you build. soon. Yep. Later, guys. Rack bones! Rack bones! Rack bones! Rack bones! Rack bones! Rack bones! Yo, Rack bones found acid in the cassette that he bought at New York Hardcore Comics in the dollar bin. <laughs> Crazy. Yep. That said, let's bring our guest back on. Let me clear the deck. Um, hold on. Clear the deck. Let's bring Mr. Jason Bittner back on. Hey, buddy. Hi there. Are you texting your upstate people? I'm texting Brian Fair because he loves rap bones. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, Rap Bones is a mixed blessing, you know? <laughs> he's, he's, he's good, man. Um, he, he's good. he wants to get Maiden on the show. Show that one of those other pictures I sent you. I'll tell you Maiden stories for days. Yeah. We, we, don't, we don't need to go deep into Maiden stories, but I do want to show this picture. You see this, we Rap Bones? We, we, can go, we, can go, Bones? we can go deep into one of my biggest idols who's one of my dearest friends. Yeah, tell us about it. I still can't believe that. I met I met Nico McBrain the first time in uh that's him get <laughs> The backstory on this fucking picture is so funny it also brings back in Braun from Mastodon. On 2005 Ozfest, me, Braun and and Matt, uh, Matt McDonough, the drummer from Mudvayne, the three of us followed Nico around like fucking three puppy dogs. We watched Maiden together and drank beer every single fucking night. As soon as Mudvayne was done playing, me and Braun would go get Matt. And the three of us watched Iron Maiden from the side stage or out in front, usually out in front, every single night. Wow. And we always, we always air drummed the same fills to Hallowed Thee by Name, the three of us together. And everybody on, on the Ozfest started calling us the Three Stooges. Because every, anytime Maiden play, you'd see the three idiots. So at one point, Nico was putting out the signature ride symbol maybe the year after, right? And he was somewhere where the three of us were at. And and we were like, hey, hey Nick, can we get a can we get a our own signature ride symbol? He's like, Yeah, next time I see all you guys, definitely, you know, no problem. And he's a man of his word. He's true to that. And like he's given me tons of shit over the years, and I bought a snare drum off him that was on live after death. Um, so this is heavy MTL up in Montreal. I think it's, uh, is that shit, Ozfest 2005? no, this is after Ozfest 2005 because Ozfest 2005 was where we all became friends. Uh, where we all became the three stooges. This okay. is like four years later. I want to say it's 2008, 2009, right? This is me holding the symbol. Okay. We're turned around right now. We're turned around. So we could, so Braun is playing. Braun is on stage playing right now. Braun looks over and he sees Nico walk up with this symbol and hand it to me. And Braun knows what's going on. He's going, and he looks over and he's like, and he looks at me and he mouths the words, you motherfucker, because he knows what's happening. He knows that Nico's giving me the ride symbol right now. And Braun hasn't received his yet. So this is the two of us. We turned around so my wife could take a picture of the two of us holding the symbol so Braun could look right at us as we were doing it. There we go. <laughs> and eventually Braun got his symbol later that day too. But still, it was just the point that it was funny. So, I mean, but if you told me, you know, that on that tour that we were, open, you know, Shadows Falls opening for Iron Maiden, the real Iron Maiden, 
plus the real Black Sabbath. Like, if you told me that when I was a 17-year-old kid, I would have never believed it. And the fact that, you know, to this day, we, we you know, we're we're pretty close. We had a, we used to have a place down in Florida for a little while. We had a condo down there, too, for about 10 years. And where we were is about 20 minutes from where Nico lives. So we were always at Rock and Ribs, and we were always hanging out with him. So he's just... He's just genuine. He's just, he's such a, such a great dude right behind those guitars that are behind me over on that side. One of them is signed by Iron Maiden. The other one's signed by the, the original Black Sabbath. And then above that is a symbol. And that's one of Nico's other symbols too. Let's talk about this dude a second. Only quickly because I'll start crying because there was, I, I had a, a, a highly emotional day yesterday. It was my mother's birthday, and she's been gone for 20 years. But it started in the morning because I was listening to the song After Image, which for Rush fans, I don't need to say any more. They understand why it's a very emotional song. So I was already bawling my face off yesterday at the loss of my hero. And then I remembered, oh, yeah, it's my mom's birthday, too. That picture is the first time that I met the greatest man to ever pick up sticks, aside from Buddy Rich. Mr. Neil Peart, my biggest influence, my biggest idol. And someone that I was, I still can't believe to this day, I was lucky enough to call my friend for over a decade. And did, you guys, still... did you guys ever play with Rush, any of the bands? No. Uh, the, the, way, the, the, the way that we got introduced to each other, um, technically, yes. Technically, my band was played for him. <laughs> um, when we were doing uh, Threads of Life, Shadows Fall, we were recording, that's the record we recorded at Dave Grohl's studio, 606, out in uh, Northridge, California. And we recorded it with Nick Raskolinis. And anybody who knows Rush knows that Nick Raskolinis was the last guy to produce the last few Rush albums. So Nick was just starting to work with, with Rush when he was finishing up with our album. So he would work with us during the week, like Monday through Thursday. And then he would fly Thursday night and go up to Toronto and he would work with rush Friday, Saturday, Sunday in pre-production. So literally there was one weekend and I, there was a, there was a couple week period that I was gone. Cause I flew over to the UK ironically to do a drum clinic festival with Nico McBrain. So I get back from, from the UK. I fly home. I spent a few days at home and then I fly back out to California to, you know, meet up with the rest of the band to continue working on the record. My tracks are all done, but, you know, we're spending money to live in California for two months. I might as well go back to California in October and enjoy the nice weather and not be on the East Coast, you know? <laughs> so I fly back out to California. I'm in the studio the first day, and Nick pulls me aside. He goes, dude. I go, what? He goes, I played your stuff for Neil the other day. I went, no, you did not. He goes, <laughs> yeah, I did. I go, what did he say? He goes, there was a part where I play. I, he goes, and he told me the song that he was playing. And he goes, and he liked that little X hat splash thing you did. And I go, of course he did, because I stole it from him. <laughs> and it, was, it was just, it was so perfect that he picked this thing out that he really liked. And I'm like, that's ah, just your thing. I just kind of changed it around. So, paying homage to the master. And he said, right. And he said, he mentioned something else too. And he said, he said something about your splash work too, that he really liked. And I was like, well, once again, I stole that all from him. But the, the point was I made some sort of impression. I still couldn't believe it. And then I'm, and then, so now Neil's heard me play drums that, that winter, I then meet Lauren Wheaton, who was his tech for so many years. I meet him at the NAMM show. I, I end up spending a long night drinking a lot of alcohol with Lauren and we talked the whole night and he kept telling me he knows who you are. And I go, no, he does not. He goes, trust me. He knows who you are. I go, no, he doesn't. And he goes, and he's, he's like, he's grabbing me. He's like, I'm telling you, he knows who you are. So now I've got this in with Lauren and Lauren says, the next time we come through town, get a hold of me, he gives me his phone number. He goes, get a hold of me and I'll make sure you can meet him. And I'm going, I'm thinking this guy, this guy's just being nice to me. There's no way this is going to happen. So that summer they come through. I happen to be home from tour. Thank God. And I call the guys at Atlantic because at that time we were on Atlantic. So now I've met Alex and I forgot one big piece of the picture. We're on a, we're on tour in April of that year. 
We have two days off in New York. We're on tour with Stone Sour. We had two days off in New York. We get a call one day from our A&R guy. He goes, hey, Alex and Betty are going to be in the offices tomorrow. Do you want to come in and meet them? Duh. Yes. So everybody in Shadows Fall goes to Atlantic. We meet Alex and Getty. We spend like a half an hour with them in our A&R guy's office. They're cool as hell. Alex is just the coolest guy in the world. Getty's cool too, but like Alex is just such a sweetheart. And I'm like, oh, my God, two-thirds of my favorite band. I can't believe this. So now I've met those guys. So now where it's the summer, they're coming through Saratoga. Now I have two ins now. I'm about to go do a, a DVD with Hudson Music, my instructional DVD, which is the same company that did Neil's. So and I know one of the owners of the company has a house in Saratoga. I'm like, Paul, are you going to see Neil before the show? He goes, yes, he is going to be in early. I go, I know this is a long shot, but do you think there's – any chance at all possible he goes he doesn't like to meet with people i'm like i know he yeah, doesn't yeah. like to meet with people yeah, he's, he's sort of, he's sort of but, he's notorious for not, but not maybe you can worry. just ask so because i don't call lauren because like i said i think he's just being nice to me i don't want to bother the guy so long story short i'm gonna try to fast forward through it paul calls me the day of the show and he goes where are you right now i go i'm home he goes neil has agreed to meet with you and those words <laughs> shot through my body like you had just shot me like with a freaking eight it, ball it, full it, of cocaine. I was just like, yeah! What, what happened at the Albany, at the, at the, um, Sar at the Saratoga Performing Arts Center in, uh, right, in Saratoga, about 45 yeah, minutes outside of yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So he goes, can you be up there in 45 minutes? Absolutely. I told my wife, I'm like, we're going. I, like we race up the back. I'm on the phone with Portnoy. He goes, whatever you do, don't talk about drums with him. I'm like, I know, I know. You don't bring up drums unless he brings up drums. So uh, <laughs> we meet, I'm going to try to fast forward. We meet him. He's the absolute coolest person in the world. It's the greatest 15 minutes of my life aside from getting married. Yes. Uh, that first meeting within five minutes not only does he sign my Slingerland artist snare drum that's in my hand right there, he starts, not only does he start talking about drums, he starts, he gets on his practice kit and he starts showing me what Peter Erskine has been teaching him. And I'm like, someone please pinch me because this is not fucking happening right now that my hero is showing me something that he's practicing. Was that, was that about the time when he changed his grip? No, it was after he started. It was after all that with yeah, Freddie yeah. and all that. No, this okay, was okay. just, he was just start studying with Peter Erskine to try to get his time better and to try to get his, his jazz sure. feel better and stuff. And Peter's mm -hmm. just a master. So anyways, I was like, oh my God, this is, this is just insane. So at the end of, at the end of the, the first, this is like, so this is the first time I meet him. Like we've gone on to a bunch of, you know, times with him since then, but this is just the first time. So we're about to leave and, and, at first, Michael, his security guy, who doesn't know me or, you know, from the hole, a hole in the ground when, he, when we first walk in, he tells my wife, no cameras. And I'm going, if you think that I'm not going to ask my hero for a picture, you're, you're out of Gotta your mind. Got to take a picture, right? So at the end of the meeting, you know, we're shaking hands. I said, Mr. Parrott, it was just, it was such an honor to meet you. Thank you so much for taking the time out because this is cutting into his warm-up time. And I, I asked him twice. I'm like, we're, we'll get out of your hair. He's like, no, it's fine. I'm like, <laughs> no, it's not. Like, <laughs> so... So he signs my drum for me, and I go, would you mind taking a, a, a quick picture? He goes, yeah, of course. And I just looked over at Michael. I just laid a smirk on my face. We laugh about it now because now That's we're awesome. friends. And he's like, yeah, but you know how many assholes want to take a picture of him? I'm like, yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know. So, so huh? we take the picture. My wife and I take a picture with him. And then my wife goes, Neil, he's been waiting his entire life to meet you. Would you mind just taking one with him? <laughs> And Neil goes, this just proves like he was comfortable with us. It's the first time he ever meets us. And it shows the, his, the humor that he had. He was such, so, such a sweetheart. He goes, yeah, we wouldn't want that last one to end up in a settlement one day now, would we? And we both just fucking started dying. Yeah. Like, it was, right just, it was such, such a great, great ending to my, my first time meeting him. And Every single time back, we were always invited back, always as guests. He'd always make time to see us. Fantastic. It, you know, it, it's, it's still, nice, it, it, it's it nice baffles nice me. People, people that have incredibly, incredibly influenced, influenced, influenced you turn, turn out, out to be really, really, really great, great people. people. Hey, let's, hey, let's, let's, let's move, move on. on. Let's, let's talk let's, about tonight.
the role of Charlie Benante will be played by Jason Bittner. You've done a lot of work with Anthrax through the years. Uh, can you lend us any perspective on, on that? Let's see if I can put this in perspective. I, I'm going to try not to unplug this camera, but this will really help to put it in perspective. Yeah, please. Uh, hold on. I have to unplug a, a billion different things. <laughs> I can't just walk over with it because I, it won't make it. Yeah, be careful. Maybe it will. Be careful. Uh, uh, you can sort of see it. Yeah. 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 That picture right there, that's me on stage looking like a goddamn deer in the headlights at the Avalon in L.A. after I had just finished my second ever show with the Among the Living lineup. Wow. It, it was surreal. Uh, and that is, that's a For All Kings backdrop, right? No, that right there? No, that's worship music. Oh, worship that, music. That picture, right. that's worship music. Yeah, I, I, I stopped. I, my last time filling in was 2012 before they even made uh, For All Kings. I got but, it. Um, wow. The, well, the first that, time, must the, been, that must have been exciting to get that call, huh? It was insane. The first time was when Charlie had, had Mia, his daughter. Um, they had a couple of days left on the Among the Living tour. We were in L.A. for Nam, or we were going to be, and I knew they were playing. And all, all I kept worrying about was, how am I going to get down to Hollywood from Anaheim to go see Anthrax on the reunion tour? Little did I know I would be playing drums for them for that show. So... Uh, how much, I, how much, I, I, how much practice, how much, once you got the call, how much work one, did you have one day. before you sat in? One day. <laughs> I got called on a Wednesday. I got called on a Wednesday. Ironically, I was at John Deddy's house in San Diego, who would end up filling, or would end up taking my place filling in. I was at John Deddy's house in, in San Diego. We drove to Anaheim Thursday. Thursday evening, I practiced with uh, Scott and Frankie. The three of us played at a rehearsal place in Anaheim. They flew to Anaheim to meet me. We jammed on Thursday. I did my signing commitments Friday morning at NAMM, flew to San Francisco, played nice. the fucking pound outside in the freezing cold, and then played the Avalon the next night. So one day, one day to get it together. Here you go. Here's, here, go play in your favorite band for one of the hardest drummers in thrash metal ever. Have fun, Jason. Go yeah. for it. And, and and through the years, through the years, you, you're their go-to guy. I mean, how many shows do you think you've done with them through the years? Uh, probably about eighty. Wow. Because uh, I um I did you know those ones in 2006. Yeah. And then I was back again in 2008 to do some South American shows when Charlie's mom passed. Yep. Um, 2012, I did the whole Mayhem Fest, then followed by a whole Canadian U.S. tour. And almost a full European tour, but then uh, then things changed, and uh, I went back to Shadows Fall, and then shortly after, John would join Anthrax. <laughs> yeah, so, 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 so the, 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 the guitar, guitar player for Shadows, for Shadows Fall, Fall plays lead, lead guitar in Anthrax, Anthrax now, correct? Yep, yep. Have you, done any, have you done any shows with him yet, with Anthrax? Yeah, yeah, we yeah. did. We actually played, we still... We actually played a few shows as Shadows Fall. We had a, we still had a tour. We did a, a tour with them basically. Uh, John doubled down for for that, but we also oh. played some, but we also played some shows where we had a fill in and John was playing in Anthrax. Got it. Got it. Um, no. Let's talk about. I want to jump, jump ahead, ahead to. The, I want to jump, jump ahead, ahead to the present day. You um, were talking about you. You were mentioning Biohazard at the top of the show, and I was like. I got to see Deluxe on Saturday. I was so fucking psyched. I put pictures. I put pictures up of us getting ready. Right now, I was just looking at it, and then I see oh, Danny. Oh, he came to the show with his kids. No, he just he came with a couple of his buddies. Oh, right on. Oh, cause oh, cause he's real tight with um, Sworn Enemy. With Pooch with Pooch from Sworn Enemy. Yeah. 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 So. Uh, so he goes, "I'll see you soon." And so I text him. I'm like, "Are you fucking coming tonight?" He's like, "Yeah." I was like, "Yes." So I told, so we had Phil Demo, you know, used to be a machine that was filling in for us. Yeah, he was filling in right. for Dave. And I told Phil, I go, dude, Danny Schuler's downstairs. He goes, dude, I haven't seen Danny since. And I go, let me guess, Soundwave 2012 when we were all there together, which was a fucking Australian tour. It was us. You know, he was in Machine Head. I was in Shadows Fall. And, you know, Danny, of course, was with Biohazard. But that's the last time we both had seen Danny physically. <laughs> Yeah, a a absolutely. And Bio has yeah. Shout out, shout out to Deluxe. Yeah, a absolutely. I want, I want to, I want to go to the present um, 
and address the yes, present yes. day. Yep. Um, hold on, I'm, I'm moving some stuff around here. Let's talk about, um, I got a couple photos here, but let's talk about what seems to be really, you know, has been your, your main focus these days, which is overkill. And, uh, you know, how you settled in there. And uh, tell us a little bit about, about your, your, uh, your current gig in overkill. Let me tell you a little bit of something first about the picture. My aunt goes, why every time I see a picture of you now, you have to have your middle fingers in the air. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to explain my aunt. This is this is not mean. This is like our thing. Like it's really like this is like this gesture of happiness. <laughs> right. This is, this is a good. This is a good thing. Really, it is. Oh, this is this is the efforts of me being a thorn in Bobby Blitz and Dee Dee Bernie's side since 1993. <laughs> We did laugh you, about did this. Did you, always, this is, did you were you always a fan of this band? Did you I've been an overkill fan since nineteen eighty six. Since the first time I heard in Union We Stand on WRUC, Union College Radio, I was like, I like this band. What I thought stuck out was they sounded different and the singer was a little was a little different. Yeah. I love Bobby Blitz. You either like his voice or you don't. It, there's yeah. no in between. There's no well, some songs I like. No, you either like his voice or you don't. Yeah. So, you know, there you go. But I've always hey, look who just showed up. <laughs> you missed it, Bob. We were having we were having a conversation yeah. earlier on, about, about mine and Mike's terrible blonde hair days. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so uh, you joined in in what 2017? Right? I joined in 2017, but like I said, I've known these guys since '93. I had this band, ironically, since Bob just joined. But since Bob just joined in the conversation. The band that I played in before I joined Stigmata was a band called Symptom Hate, and we were like. Dude, it was like a death metal band, kind of, but we, we wore corpse paint and we had. <laughs> <laughs> Bob, you're not the only one that remembers. Blitz remembers too, very vividly, and I'm going to tell you the story why. So, so we, we, this was like, this was 1993. This was before <laughs> corpse paint and fucking all this shit was fucking wait, popular. Wait, 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 cool. Can I Back then, we just got laughed whoa, at. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Let me interject something real quick about you being an overkill he, at least talking about corpse paint here's overkill for i know i know so, I, I know so at least you missed this so, era and and here's another tie-in the guy all the way to the left that's dan fits when when i joined overkill and that picture i showed you earlier up on the wall it's me and spitzy when when i first played with anthrax when i first joined when i first joined anthra or joined overkill i got a text from danny that said Congratulations, you've now been in both of my bands. <laughs> now, the key word is you've been in both of what bands? My bands. I took a screenshot of the text and I sent it to Scott and Charlie and I went, my band. <laughs> <laughs> both, both fucking dying. Bob yes, we have, we have paper mache skulls on stage. So anyways, so I'm playing in this corpse paint band and we open up for Overkill. Now, I had met Blitz and Dee Dee years prior at a Slayer show in, in, in Poughkeepsie, okay? And they remembered me from whatever reason, probably because I was a pain in the ass. So 1993, I'm on the side of the stage and I go, will you please, please check out my band? Please check out my band. And Blitz is like, yeah, sure, kid, whatever. You know, I'll check out your band, sure. They both said they would. And I'm going, yeah, bullshit, they're not going to do it, right? So, and I played a lot of drums in this band, a lot of double bass, a lot of fucking, you know, look at me go, look at how fast I can play. So the 23-year-old kid is just fucking doing his thing. So I'm playing 15 minutes to the set. I fucking look over, and Blitz and Didi are standing right fucking there. And that's when all of a sudden, like, a, like you know, the little, oh, they're actually watching. Holy shit. So now fast forward to the end of the show. 15 minutes later, we got, you know, our 20 minutes on stage, and they kicked us out the back door with my gigantic drum set. So now I'm outside, you know, tearing my shit down with corpse paint fucking melting off my face. <laughs> Blitz is out there smoking a cigarette, drinking a beer. Hey, kid, good job. You know, so now I joined the band and like he just he still remembers all this shit because he's like a fucking elephant. He remembers all the stories. And every time someone goes, you've known Jason that long, he'll go. <laughs> he goes, I remember him standing on the side of the stage. Tearing all his fucking drums down with corpse paint ran off his fucking face. So, so it's just, it's one of those things that I made 
whatever kind of impression I made, I made some sort of impression at that point. Two years later, I met Tim Miller, who was their drummer for years. And Tim and I became good friends. And from 95 on, I was at Saratoga Winners every single time they played. I pretty much was usually their runner. I'd usually be there bringing them back and forth from the hotel or whatnot, blah, blah, blah. And I'd be the guy that would cart Tim and whoever off to the strip bar, off to the Carlos that night, every time they came to town. So I just, the Carlos. I just, I just became the overkill hangout dude at Winners. So they knew me as Tim's friend, but they all, they always knew I was a drummer too. And Blitz, Blitz tends to elaborate on the story now because he goes like, because he was telling it like when I first joined the band, he's like, yeah, he come to Saratoga Winners and he'd be sitting back there with a pair of sticks in his back pocket just waiting for Timmy to collapse off the drums. And I'm like, well, that's not 100% true. It's about 80% true, but. <laughs> yeah. So for like the first year I was in the band, I was I was sticks. <laughs> that was this my nickname. This is the now, record. Now I'm the hit man. <laughs> Who produced this? Zeus. Zeus. Boy, this Zeus guy. Zeus not too. Boy, this, this guy, Zeus, follows you, or you follow Zeus around everywhere. You know, I, I got to say this about Overkill. Zeus is a great man. producer that works his ass off. I got to say this about Overkill, man. They, they, they've, they, they've, they've hung in there through the years. Bobby Blitz has an incredible work ethic. You know, this is a band that never folded up their tent and went away. They, nope. they through thick and through thin, they, they stuck it out. They deserve, they really deserve any sort of accolades they get these days, man. They, they absolutely do. And, you know, to be honest with you, it seems like our, yeah, Paulie, I bet you are dying. You are dying. I got a, I got good AK ones too. But I'm gonna make sure that Drew shows that one last picture because it ties into Iron Maiden too. Anyways, uh, which, which, which picture is that? The one of me and AK where I said, make sure you remind me yeah, 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 the story it. that yeah, goes with it. this one. But um, I, you know when when I've heard st I I know what Overkill's endured because I've saw them at every yeah. single point of their sure. career. I saw them in the big venues. I saw them in the little venues. I saw them in the venues where I've gone, holy shit, they're playing fucking there. So, you know, I and I know that from just being in a band. I know what it's like to go from playing the SPACs of the world to going to play the fucking QE2s and the CBGBs of the world. And there's yeah. nothing against those clubs, but just because you're here one day does not mean you're going to fucking be here the next year. It just, sure. it's, it's ebb and flow. So... Yeah. It's about being consistent, but Derek told me, uh, my guitar player, Derek Taylor Skullman, told me that when he first joined Overkill, which is about 20 years ago now, like when he first joined, they were at the down point of things, not at the mm -hmm. up where we are now. He said, you know, it was to a point where just to break even on a tour, they would do two shows in one day in Europe. They would go play a festival in the afternoon Wow, and, and then go and play a club somewhere two hours out. He goes, and one night, he goes, one night, I don't remember where it was, somewhere in Eastern Europe. We went and played a festival for like 50,000 people and then got in the van. He goes, yes, van, not got in the bus, got in the <laughs> van, and then went and played for eight people, he said. He goes, and that's including the people that work there. Eight. Yeah. So not only is that a ball crusher first that – you have to play two shows in one day just to survive. But how about first you just you just came off the high of playing in front of fifty thousand people to get your nuts kicked to oh now now hey hey guys you gotta play double as long for eight people. Oh fuck. Yeah. <laughs> that's 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 tough, man. That's tough. Yeah. Now what's going on here? <laughs> All right. <laughs> that's that's me and AK from Flotsam. This was <laughs> I fucking love this picture. All right, so here's the backstory on this. This is us just imitating what could have happened where we just came from. All right, so this is uh oh what the fuck festival? This is the Rock Hard Festival in Germany, uh, and this is 2016 because this is the year before I joined. Um, Overkill because I played the same festival with Overkill the following year. And I was pissed because Overkill played the, the year that Flotsam played, but they played the next day and I wasn't able to, to see them. So, because we were already off to another city. So anyways, when we got to the show, we realized that one of the bands playing 
Paul Diano is the fucking singer in the band, and we just didn't realize it because it, it wasn't like he went by Diano or anything like that. <laughs> so this is where the Maiden thing ties in, right? So we're all like, holy shit, fucking Paul Diano's here. So that's that's all like we're like just holy shit, like the whole fucking day. And he had just gotten in a motorcycle accident or something, right? So he's in a fucking wheelchair. So the band that he plays playing with is on stage right before we play. Like they're they're on and then we're on. Like it was like this weird time slot in the afternoon. Like he was on like at one and like we were on like at one forty five, right? Mm -hmm. So me and AK are standing on the side of the stage and what it was, it was just him doing maiden tunes with this band, but they just went under this band name and Paul Diano was singing from a fucking wheelchair. So he's singing from the wheelchair, he's got like three beers next to him, and we're like Fucking A, man. And he didn't sound that bad either. And we're just like rocking out. I'm like looking at AK. I'm like, I want to go warm up, but I don't, I fucking don't want to miss any of this. So, you know, <laughs> shit, I go grab a pair of sticks and I'm like doing the backwards stick thing and like just jumping up and down my feet just to try to, you know, get things moving because I want to watch Paul Diano. So it turns out like two of his crew members are fucking huge Flotsam fans. They have no idea that we're following them as soon as they're done. They get done, they watch us walk up on stage, and they're like, what the fuck? So as soon as we got done with our 45-minute set, they're like, dude, we fucking love you guys, blah, blah, blah. Me and AK were like, hey, not for nothing. Can you take us in to meet Paul? And and he's like, yeah, yeah, just give us a second. So we gathered everybody in Flotsam, and we all went in, we all went in to meet Paul Diano. So I have my back. I'm like, I got to fucking have him sign something. We take a picture with him and I'm like, oh, would you mind signing this for me? I said, I said, I've, you know, been waiting over 30 years to meet you. He goes, oh, Jesus, I feel sorry for you as he's signing it. <laughs> like, I'm like, dude, you're a legend. He goes, ah, no, I'm not. I'm like, <laughs> whatever. So no, that, first, that first Iron Maiden record is the first two Iron Maiden man. records are fucking great. I don't care. Oh, you know, wow. Bruce, Dick, Bruce Dickinson's a great singer, but he can't sing those songs. Just like Paul Diano can't sing Bruce's songs. Absolutely. But anyways, so let's get to the picture. I don't see this when we're in the room because I'm just so preoccupied with holy shit. I'm finally meeting Paul Diano. So we're walking out of the room and AK goes to me, nudges me with his arm. He goes, did you see the giant pile of blow behind him? And I went, are you fucking kidding me? He goes, I am not kidding you. I go, I didn't, I didn't even see it. He goes, how could you not miss it? It was like the size of Mount Kilimanjaro. So that, <laughs> that's, why, that's, some, that's why whoever had my camera just took the picture. I'm like, take a picture of me and AK right now. I'm like, let's pretend we just, well, we did see it. So that's why I went, <laughs> like the pic, that's what we would have looked like. <laughs> and Amazing. I was like, I'm Amazing. like, dude, I said, after reading his biography and reading about all his problems with drugs and never being able to get over borders and all that, I'm like, this motherfucker still doesn't learn. Like, <laughs> just like, must have been like the same guy that said to John Entwell. So, oh, come on, you're over 50. It's still okay to do blow. One more time. John Entwell, and John Entwell still went out with his boots on in Vegas, you know? I know, but it's like, dude, like, there, there comes a time, like, all yeah. right, there's... There's some drugs you, you got to put it down, guys. It's not. There's an age limit to. You, you, don't, you don't gotta don't tell me tell about it. I've been clean and sober for over. almost 13 years this, now. This, this shit's gotta stop, man. You know, it's like, oh my god. Yeah, it's like, crazy. I hey, drink me, two cups of coffee do, right uh, now. Let me do my uh, final sponsor shout out, and uh, let's and we'll come back and we'll take questions from around the world. Okay. Well, there you have it. This is the New York Hardcore Chronicles Live, and our guest today is our old friend Jason Bittner, currently of Overkill and Shadows Fall, Stigmata and Flotsam and Jetsam, Crisis, and a couple others. We are sponsored by New York Hardcore Comics, The Organic Grill, The Texas Silver Rush, Chain Reaction Records, and Skateboards, DTFM Vinyl Distro, Generation Records, and Located in Corpus Christi, Texas, Chacho's Tacos opened their doors in 2001, home of the almighty Chacho's Taco. They cook up an incredible home-style Tex-Mex food, and this month they're celebrating their 20th anniversary. They've been supporting underground music since the beginning. In their own words, we ain't stopping anytime soon. Touring bands that play Corpus Christi swing by and get a home-cooked meal at Chacho's Tacos. We got you. The underground scene will never die. Please follow us on Facebook or on Instagram. Yo, what's up? Chain Reaction Records and Skateboards, located in Lakewood, Colorado, is the Rocky Mountain headquarters for all things punk, hardcore, and, believe it or not, my friend, metal. 
Established in 2014, they have the largest selection of CDs, shirts, stickers, patches, and accessories between Chicago and Los Angeles. Goddamn electric. From the pit to the ditch, they got your back. Get in touch with them at www.chainreactionrecords.com. Also, New York Hardcore Comics opened there in 2013, selling comic books, punk rock, and hardcore memorabilia, toys, statues, skateboard decks, tapes, vinyl, and all things horror. We love helping bands push their demos and new tracks, so please stop by and drop off your new music. We have in-store events like Magic the Gathering and Warhammer tournaments, plus meet and greets with bands and some live performances. Open seven days a week and shipping worldwide. Find us online through Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and eBay, located at 117 Main Street, Lovesley Dobbs Ferry, New York, www.newyorkhardcorecomics.com. Also, while we're at it, I want to shout out um, New York Hardcore Comics. Uh, I did a book signing up there uh, last, uh, what was that, on Saturday, a couple days ago. It was great. I want to thank them for hosting this uh, event. It was really nice. We had some great homemade Italian food. Uh, it, it was really great. A bunch of people showed up. Uh, they have been, in, since the beginning of the show, uh, New York Hardcore Comics has been on board as a sponsor. Honestly, uh, this show would not exist without them. Uh, here's the two guys from Ape, uh, Logan and Kevin, uh, giving the book a read. Uh, so thank you, everybody, that has, um, yes, the signing at New York Hardcore Comics was great. Uh, and the Italian food was fantastic. My light, my mic is low. My mic is never low. How can my mic be? Weird, weird stuff on the show today. I'm not sure. A couple volumes are up and down. Um, so I apologize. I apologize for that. By the way, people are asking about the book and, and the book situation. Um, the book is sold out, but the second printing is on the way. Hey, 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 it's on the way. Um, slightly different cover uh, in yellow. And uh, pages this time are going to be glossy. We're going to go with nice glossy pages. Uh, this is the second printing. The pre-order for the second printing goes up next week. Of course, it's Stone Films NYC. It's $24.95 for the book, www.stonefilmsnyc.com. I will let you know, but the second printing is going up soon. So those that missed out the first time. And, of course, all you patrons out there, the book is free. If you are a patron. The book is free. All you have to do is is pay for the um, pay for the shipping. That's right, the shipping. It's seven dollars uh, for domestic, uh, twenty four dollars I think for 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 international. If you are a patron, the book is free. Please support this show via Patreon. That is why we're still doing it. Listen, as much as I've said this, as much as you've heard it, it's the God's honest truth. You know, your support through Patreon has enabled this show to happen 160 episodes in. I want to shout out a couple uh, of my latest patrons, Terrence Colinane, uh, Brendo Cato, Chris Goldbach, Sebastian Gorgone uh, out in Long Island. I want to thank you all. Um, yo, the postage... The postage to the UK for the book is 24 bucks. It's expensive. I don't run the friggin' postal service, so I don't want to hear about it. It sucks. As a matter of fact, if you want to order this book, order it from Cortex in Germany. Uh, they, they're getting um, they're getting a whole bunch of more books. In Europe, if you don't want to pay the 24 bucks for shipping, order it from Cortex. Uh, that's my suggestion to you. And yeah, thank you, Lori. I'm not low. Jason's very loud. So, um, yes, thank you. This show's the easiest thing to support. We love you, Drew. I love you guys, too, and, and, and thank you. Uh, while we're going on, I just want to mention the next the next, next four shows uh, coming up. You know, how many freaking drummers do we get? It's like this show's like a freaking drummer's collective. I swear to God. You know, you know how, why do we end up with so many drummers on the show? Wednesday, December 8th, Michael McDermott from Joan Jett and the Blackhearts, uh, formerly of Bouncing Souls and Murphy's Laws on the show. Sunday, December 12th, this is Boston, not LA, 40th anniversary 
with Bob Sensi from Jerry's Kids, drummer Bob Farapples from the FUs, and drummer Brian Betzger from Jerry's Kids and Gangrene. Sunday, December 19th, Kevin Seconds from Seven Seconds. Come on now. And here's a new one. Yo, Wednesday, December 26th, 22nd, Mike Bullshit from uh, SFA and Go and Bullshit Monthly Fanzine is coming on the show. So there's lots, there's lots going on. Um, oh, you got the book this morning, Laurent? Good, buddy. I'm glad. Listen, a couple people are reaching out like, where's my book? Fucking Postal Service is a goddamn mess in this country. So, you know, um, you know, be patient. Be patient, my friends. Also got to remind you that December 5th is, is now, it is now the Vinny Stigma birthday bash. It's also the Antidote NYC record release show with The Take, Enziguri, Non-Residence, and Fire is Murder. Sunday matinees are back on the Bowery. All ages and free, you friggin' bum. The hell you want me to do? Go play in your fucking living room? It's fucking free, for Christ's sake. You know? Your animal. What, do you, what else? What do I need to do? Come play in your bedroom. It's free. It's all ages. It's on a Sunday. Get your ass down there. Uh, let's let's uh, take some questions for Jason Bittner. Please post them up now. Now. Post them up. Yep. Here we go. Yeah, yeah. Let's bring Jason back on. Hey, buddy. I'm, I'm trying to find a claw picture for Laurent. <laughs> What? I don't have anything on my phone. Shit. What are you looking for? Laurent, because you said you were just talking to him about the your book he got it and he just got it today in France. Oh, yeah, yeah, trying yeah, to yeah. find a picture of us on tour from nineteen ninety seven and that would explain the claw, but we'll just keep that to be uh yeah. our All right, person. you ready for you ready for some questions, buddy? I am ready. Okay. Let's uh well let's start with this kind of statement from Paulie Pork Chops. Shout out to Jason for being in two of the four bands in my big four of thrash, Overkill and Flotsam and Jetsam. Can't wait to hear Overkill's 20th album and hope to see you on the road soon. Thank you, Polly. Yep. I miss right. seeing you on, on, on Twitch, Polly. I, I know Polly Porkchop. He is one of the biggest Flotsam fans. That cool. Is- Joe Halleck says, has Jason ever practiced with ankle weights? Some, that double bass is some of the cleanest. Can you, can A long you hit- time ago when I was a kid. Could you hip us to your regiment, uh, your practice regiment? Playing a lot, a lot of playing. Uh, uh, you know, not everybody uses ankle weights. Gene Hoagland uses them. I tried doing that years and years and years ago to try to build things up, but I never found that it really worked for me. Um, to, I, I mean, literally, it's just it's just hours and hours of playing and hours of touring. It, it, a yeah. lot of touring. Live shows have really – I was – a. I was a pretty consistent drummer before I started touring, but touring is what helps you become more consistent when you're doing it night after night after night. Yeah, that, that, that makes sense. Uh, Ray Hogan, uh, one of our big supporters, is it harder to follow Scott Ian's right hand or the flotsam tempo changes? <laughs> <laughs> you know, ironically, um, what, what's funny about that is, is believe it or not, the drummer sets the pace in Anthrax, no matter who it is. Uh, and the reason why I say that is the first the first time I filled in, Scott pulled me aside. He goes, don't play skeletons at album tempo. <laughs> I go, you got it, sir. Any chance that I can go five BPMs less from my feet, I'll take it. <laughs> um, and some of those... So, hey, hey, shouting out Chris Contos. What's up? Bro? Hey, Mr. Contos. Happy anniversary today to you and Gwen there, buddy. He says, I love you, Jason Bittner. I love oh. you back there, Mr. Contos. Me and Mr. Demo were talking about I didn't you know you guys weekend. had it like that. <laughs> <laughs> Chris Contos, the only machine head drummer. Woo! Yeah, I love Chris Contos, man. You know, sorry you couldn't come see his play in freaking California, Chris. Fucking guy, you know, come out to California once a decade to play. Um, <laughs> let's see. Um, bromance. Yeah. <laughs> bromance. Um, Jason, oh, here's one. And, and this is Will uh, from a car bomb parade. 
Jason once told me he wasn't entirely pleased with the Threads of Life record. Has his opinion changed over the years? Yeah, I'm thoroughly displeased with it. <laughs> <laughs> Next question. <laughs> no, you know what? Look, every I, I'm the first to admit that not every record I've made has been one where I've gone, oh, this one's awesome, because yeah. it's, it's, it's just not. You know, there's ebbs and flows in everybody's career, and you're just, right. you just can't make a great record every single time out. I'll even tell you that there's Rush albums that I really don't like either, and they're my favorite band. Go Yankees. That's right, Chris. But, <laughs> you know, there's a time and place for everything. For Threads of Life, the reason why I don't like that record that much, Forevermore is a good song. I always say that there's, there's a, half that record I like, half of it I really don't like. My drumming, I thought, was stale on that record. I just wasn't, I I was at a point where I think it was just album tour, album tour, album tour. Even though we were working so hard on it, I just didn't really, I re, really feel that I had much fresh ideas. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't like thoroughly inspired. Even though I was inspired when I could take a walk around the, you know, back end of the, of the building and look at like fucking Kurt Cobain's cabinet and shit, like right there in front of me. I'm like, not for nothing, that's pretty cool. But like it just it can't make it it just can't force great music to happen. Like I think that some of the songs were were good. Some of them weren't strong. The production was is real slick. Fair enough. And I think that the two records that we made past Threads of Life blow that album away. Okay, f f fair enough. Thomas Starkey says, "What was it like playing with Marty Friedman? Dude is a technical wizard." absolutely awesome the coolest thing about marty's thing was when we did i did six songs on his record tokyo jukebox 2 and when we did that we did it at village recorders in la and when we did the record he goes i'm going to send you some demos but really don't learn the parts that much because everything's going to change when we get in the studio and i'm like why are you even sending it to me in the first place then so what's the point of sending me anything right so in reality once we got in there he just had me start playing like grooves and stuff and then he'd go He'd ask me to play like certain drummers. Okay, play like Neil Peart. Okay, I'll do this. All right, now play like Peter Chris. Splash, 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 splash. Yeah. splash. Now play something like Dave Grohl would play. So, you know, now play something like Vinnie Paul would play. So he started making me emulate these dudes, and I'd play these parts, and he'd just have, record these parts, and then he'd, like, make up riffs to it. And he would just, re he just recorded all this shit. And that's what we did for three straight days. We just recorded shit. I do stuff and he'd go, all right, I'm going to go in and just do some guitar work. And he was just doing this all on the fly. So basically he used me for three days to get all the stuff that he needed. And then basically he put all of it together later on. Like when I got the full record, I was like, oh, wow, that's how he put that. Because I'm like the whole entire time I'm going, I'm just thinking he's recording parts and I'm going, how is he even going to make this even like work? Amazing. And then when I hear the final product, I was like, holy shit. So that, it that's was. A, that's a guy that's. That's a guy that's. Yeah, it, Marty's a stellar musician. So it was yeah. just. It was just. It was. It was great playing with him, and that's just a you know another. It was another connection to Megadeth because I had already done a, a clinic tour with with Dave Elson like probably a few years before I did Marty's record. So right, it was awesome. Um, speaking of Vinnie Paul, here's a, here's a shot uh, you and him. Uh, a Vinnie Paul memory, perhaps for us. I have a lot, uh, but that one right there is great, which is why I sent you that picture. That's Vinny sitting on my kit and sitting in and playing with 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 Shadows Fall on my kit. Wow! And you know, by the end of that tour, it was me dressed up as Vinny playing on his kit with his brother. And that's all over YouTube. Uh, I I have a I have a a, a lot of great Vinny Paul stories. I'll just tell you. One right now is probably one of the best times I had hanging out with Vinny was when we were in Australia. Um, we did and this. Actually, this is that tour I was just telling you about. Um, the Soundwave tour in 2012. There's, I mean, it's just like 30 bands that are on it, right? So Shadows Falls on it. Hell yeah is on it. And we're just, we're just putting out new records. So I've got our mixes. Vinny's got his mixes of their latest album. So... The two of us are sitting, yes, I do remember that roller rink show. Um, so, and no, it's not the only time I played a roller rink. Uh, <laughs> so the two of us are sitting in, in, we're going from, we were going from somewhere, I know our destination was Sydney. We were flying to Sydney from somewhere else, you know, one other town in, in, in Australia. And it's only like an hour flight. So we're flying like around five o'clock. So both bands, hell yeah, and Shad's are in the, in the airport. And everybody is just fucking 
shit-faced annihilated. Except, well, except for me and Vinny. We were the only two that were somewhat sober. And we're sitting there like listening to all the music and stuff. Fast forward, Chad steals a bottle of, of, of vodka from the fucking bar somehow, gets it on the plane. Now both bands are on the plane. Chad somehow finds a way to open this bottle. Both bands are passing the, a bo- an open bottle of vodka around while me and Vinny are like hiding like in the back row like, we're not with these dudes. I know it looks like we're related to these guys, but we have nothing to do with these guys because we're they thinking we're all going to jail tonight because we have a, we have an open bottle of liquor on a plane. That's a, that's a no no. Somehow we didn't get caught, but everybody by time we landed got back to the hotel. Everybody in all the bands were just they were done. Like as soon as they got the room keys, passed out. You know, in bed. It's like seven thirty. Me and Vince, the only ones sort of sober. Yeah, and we were pretty sober. Sober enough to realize that it's time to go get dinner. Literally walked around the corner, sat in a nice little Italian restaurant, had a nice dinner, just the two of us, went back to the hotel, nice sleep, played the show the next day. Okay. So it was one of those stories where, yes, I've got tons of, of them where it's us partying, but this was like the one where we really weren't partying. <laughs> now... Uh, here's another one going going through the the Jason Bittner Hall of Fame. Uh, this dude, this dude on our right here, uh, big influence. The, well, the guy on the right was the guy we just talked about. Well, my right in the picture was the guy yeah. we just talked about yeah. filling in for. Yeah, the other guy, the other guy, the guy that I always wanted to fill in for. Right. <laughs> I always call that the you know. That's like, aside from Neil Peart, those are the two guys that made me the drummer I am. You know, that's, and that's, you know, I've known Dave and Charlie since the early 90s, but if you told me, you know, there'd be a picture of us, you know, somewhere around 2004 of the three of us when we were all over there playing in our respective bands. Well, actually, Charlie wasn't playing. Charlie was just on a promo tour for We've Come For You All. But still, you know, I'm not a fan in that picture. I'm, I'm a peer in that picture. But they're still my heroes. So... You know, it's just, that's just a cool shirt. And Portnoy loves it too. He's like, yeah, I just love you to wear the Dream Theater shirt. I'm like, of course you do. <laughs> and, you know, uh, on, the, on the Portnoy tip, I mean, his name comes up a lot in this, in this Rush mix. Do, do you, I mean, can he go? I, I, I know that I can't imagine that they would yes. ever do it, right? They, yes, I, he can. I know he could do it, but I can't imagine that, they would go out and do it, but there's a lot of us. Look, there's a lot of us that could do it. Uh, yeah. Let's call a spade a spade. There's a lot of us that could do it. Am I, am I going to say yeah, that yeah. I could do it? Yes. I am 110% going to say that I could do it, yep. but could I do it? Like the guy behind me in the banner, see in the yep. corner over there or the, or the guy who's, who's I'm ruining my whole thing right now. Whose name is on this stick? I don't know. I don't think so. I couldn't. Just like when I filled in for Charlie Benante, I couldn't do it like Charlie could do it. Right. There's a lot of guys that, yes, you could fill in for Neil, but it's just like John Bonham. It's not a job that's that's doable. It's it's not it's not doable. It's it's just yeah. not. Yes, Jason could fill in for John. And now right. let's let's wait another 15 years or so until Olivia Peart gets to be, you know, 24, 25. Maybe she will be as good as her father was. But right. until then, I don't I don't want to see anybody else in that chair. I really don't. And that's no disrespect to Mike. And I, I know Mike will probably – I know Mike well enough that Mike will probably tell you the same thing. Yeah. You know, we yeah. all we all would love to secretly be in a room with those two guys – just to play some of those songs. We all would love to do that and have video for our own personal viewing. But anybody who actually would get in the room with those guys and then go on stage with them, well, get ready for this, because here comes the bullseye, because it's right on your head. <laughs> yeah. Nope. Hey, hey here's, a, here's a good one. Uh, Josh, uh, Josh, uh, son. Josh, uh, son. I would love to hear Jason talk about his time in crisis. I've never heard him mention it, and it's rarely <laughs> mentioned, period. All right. I'm, I'm giggling a little bit because there's a reason why it wasn't mentioned for a long time, because I had a lot of animosity towards just that name. I did. 
Um, and the reason why I, I pretty much, I don't have that animosity and I don't, and I, and I feel free to talk about crisis now is because Avzal and I became back to the, the real close friends that we were when, when I left that band in 98. Well, after 20 years, we're back to being that close again. And it was after we were able to rekindle our friendship. And after I realized that a lot of the animosity that I thought I had towards Avzal and Karen was not, was not Avzal's fault at all. at all. It was her fault. And he was her boyfriend. And he, when you're in a relationship, I'm sorry, you're, you have to, if you want to stay with the girl, of course, well, yeah, the drummer's an asshole. The drummer's got, you know, yeah, let's get rid of him. Or yeah, I'll back you up on whatever you say. I'll say it about him too. But after we had a heart to heart and I learned a lot of things that about the past, I let those bygones be bygones and realized that we were much better off being friends and, and us working, going ahead with our personal futures and, I think it's great that he's writing music with Fred again, and I've even we were even talking about me playing some percussion and stuff on it again. Now, now you played on you played on the yeah, album. Chris, you, you know Chris, yeah, exactly. Chris, yeah, Chris, Chris knows, and you you played on the Crisis record, a couple tracks on the Howling. I didn't realize that you were actually in the band that long and did that many live shows with them. Yeah, I did a, a year of touring with them, six months with the Spud Monsters over in Europe, and then we did a tour with Fu Manchu in the States. Yeah. Wow. A lot of drummers on that record and you know two of them being you know later becoming pretty notable guys with me and and roy from stone sour i roy mean boy. first yep roy was all i mean roy only left roy would have been the drummer in that band roy was going to be the drummer in crisis but he literally he got the call at the studio when we were all doing drums from max hey you want to join soulfly he literally told us there it literally, it happened there, and literally it was like, all right, well, I guess Roy's going to move to Arizona. So it was like, all right, do you want to be the drummer? I'm like, all right, I guess I'll be the drummer then. So that's literally what happened. Hey, shouting out Hoya from Madball and the, and the, spoken, hey. word, and the spoken Word podcast. Uh, Got to say, yo, best show out there. You think this show's good? Hoya's the man. I, I love, I tune any chance I get to Hoya. I got to bring him back on the show. Uh, he speaks, he's, he, Hoya speaks a language I can understand. He's a real New York hardcore soldier. Also want, want to shout out um, our friend, Mr. Bob, 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 Paris Mayhew from Cro-Mags and his new, jo and his new um, band Agros as Stuart Copeland. Yeah, we, we talked a little bit of, a little bit about Hi, Paris. I haven't seen Paris probably in 25 plus years. Probably the last time when Sigma played a show with one version of the Chromags or another. Yeah. Yeah. Shit. yeah, Hoya. Fucking love you, bro. Yeah. Um, yeah, yo, Par Paris's new stuff is great, man. It's, re it's really good. Um, awesome. that said, hey, let's, um, this guy, Paris says, what up? Um, you know, here's a guy that gets a lot of heat for his drumming, man. And uh, personally, uh, you know, I've worked with him. Uh, you know, he's in he's in the film I did a couple years ago. Who the fuck is that guy? The Fabulous Journey of Michael Lago. He was very gracious. Um, why does this guy catch so much heat uh, for his drumming? And, and what's your take on it? Well, you see my arm is around him, right? <laughs> yes. I have an affinity for the man. Now, I, I, like I know I mentioned Dave and Charlie, and that's like, I mean, to me, as far as thrash drumming, those are my biggest influences. But I'm not going to say that Lars isn't an influence because Lars was the first. Lars was the first thrash metal drummer that influenced me. Lars was the first guy that I heard play fast double bass when I heard Fight Fire with Fire. I was like, holy yeah. shit. There you go. But Dave and Charlie are the guys that made me go, Oh my God. Like, I mean, I heard Lars and I'm like, all right, I can probably do that. Eventually I heard Dave and Charlie. I was like, ah, I tap out. And you know, it's like, I don't get it, but up through injustice for all, all those records were influential. All those records were cool drum parts. All those, all those records had a, had a, a giant impact on me. Yeah. Um, so I will always defend Lars, but, 
But even he said in interviews, oh, I got tired of racing those guys. And I know what it's like being a professional drummer and being with your peers. And I know what it's like when one guy put his record out and it won Best Metal Performance, but this guy's record's almost close. But there's just as much double bass on this record. Well, but there's a blast beat on this one, so this one must be better because this guy blasts, but this guy doesn't blast. <laughs> but this guy plays a little faster than this guy goes, so this guy definitely must be better. You understand where I'm getting? It fucking becomes fucking maddening after a while. And it gets into your head, which is probably another reason why I didn't think I played well on Threads of Life because it's not as fast as the other records, which is just stupid bullshit. It's adolescent bullshit, but it's what we all think of when we're new drummers, when we're young. Everybody wants to play fast. But it got to a point where Charlie and Dave kept going and Lars just said, eh, I'm good. I'm good. I'm going to... I'll be back here, guys. <laughs> so this shot is me and him from OzFest 2008. Uh, and that's at the Metallica barbecue that they invited us to on the night before the show after their sound check. Now, I've met Lars a few times prior to this night. I met him first time in 1986 on the Master of Puppets tour. He was cool. I met him at Download in uh, 2002. We spent an afternoon with him then. He was cool as hell then. But this time was the time where he knew who I was, and this was the time where we actually had a night together, drank a bunch of wine, and really kind of just bonded. So bonded to enough where I was comfortable enough with him that I actually busted his balls about the fucking St. Anger snare drum sound. <laughs> so it, you know, it was cool. We had a really good night. He was really cool to me the next day. I played on his drum set in the fucking in the Metallica dressing room the next day. So I, I'll, I'll never shit talk Lars because he's not the player that fucking Dave and Charlie is, and he'll tell you that. But you know what? He's the guy that started it all, and he was 110% right about Napster, and I wanted to make shirts for years that just said Lars was right. Because you know he was. Like? You know what I like? I like how Hetfield stands by him. Like yeah. that's that, I love how Hetfield never There would be wavered. no Metallica without Lars Ulrich. That's his dude. There wouldn't be. You know, that's his. That's his guy. Um, you know, I like how Hetfield's never is always stuck by him, man. I like that. Molly Porkchop's right. He goes, "The Lars buttons on Twitch were beyond, beyond funny." When I was when I was doing the live stream, we had we had this whole thing for Lars. Everybody thought I was talking shit, and I always explained, "No, we love Lars." But I had like nine different buttons of all these various Lars pictures. Oh my god. There would be times I would just be pressing Lars buttons for like five minutes straight, just cracking myself up, and I'd be like, I don't give a shit. I'm not going to play any more songs. I'm just going to press buttons all day. And there was, there was a friend, my friend Chris, he's a drummer in the UK, and, and Lars is his biggest idol. And every time like I'd, I'd pull up a picture of me playing Lars's drum set, and I'm like, who's this? Not Chris playing Lars's drums. Who's this? Not Chris with Lars. You know, it was just these stupid things, but it was fucking funny as hell. Hey, when, when, when is your next uh, live show? December 18th with Shadows Fall. Yeah, where, did I, where, did I, where is that? Oh, here it is. In the old, in the lovely, in lovely Worcester. 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 In the Palladium in Worcester. There yeah. you go. Where I'll be proudly wearing my Yankees gear. Yeah. <laughs> Good for you. Uh, let's take another. Um, yeah, here you go. Paris says, "Ride the lightning is all you need to know about Lars rules." Yep. Yeah, yep. man, pretty much. He's right. <laughs> right. I mean, he's right. But I'm gonna just interject this too, Paris. Since you did the Anthrax live DVD, you've you've had that camera near Charlie. <laughs> it's night and day. <laughs> uh, did you guys talk about that? Yeah, we did. We talked about Dave Lombardo about 15 minutes ago, Ivan. Uh, it'll be up on YouTube after. <laughs> so, yeah. So Dave's good. the greatest. Hey, um, the greatest. any, uh, as we head down the home stretch here, uh, sponsor shout outs. Do you want to shout out any of your, any of your, your sponsors? Absolutely. Pearl drums, Zildjian cymbals, Remo drum heads, Promark drumsticks, LP percussion, DW pedals, Simpad. Let's see what else. Gator cases. Uh, I think that's it. <laughs> Gator cases, I like that one. Gator cases. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Let me see yeah. what uh 
I'm just, I'm just looking at the wall back there, seeing what. It, it looks like I have this like set up for the shot, but it's absolutely totally not that. This is just my <laughs> lazy ass. This is my lazy ass that has a whole bunch of shit on the floor from getting it home from the show the other night. That <laughs> is, is like, that your is that your practice set or or, or, or my I, my studio yeah. kit's in the background, but like the problem was this last Overkill show, I hadn't seen my live kit in 19 months, so I brought wow. a bunch of hardware and shit with me because I'm like, I don't even know what the fuck's down here. <laughs> yeah so it was being better safe than sorry cool hey i want to thank you for coming on the show today it was no great. problem thank uh, you for having friend. me yeah it was really nice chopping it up with you absolutely um, been a blast yeah anybody you want to shout out any friends or any, anything out there no i just want to give a shout out to all the people i've seen come up in this conversation that in bands that we've played together for for fucking years like i said you know, Paris, Hoya, Madball, you know, we all played shows, so many fucking shows, whether or not it was me and Stigmata, me and Crisis, me and Burning Human. Usually a lot of it was Stigmata or Shadows Fall. It's just, it's nice to, you know, see those people out there again. Of course, fucking Mr. Chris Contos still chiming in there. One of my, one of my very, very, very good friends. Good. Well, I wish, I wish you all the best. And uh, Paulie you, says, Drew. great show. Thanks, Drew, Jason. Yes, Stephen and Rap Bones. And uh, listen, I'll track you down one of these days. I'll let you know. I'd love to come see you play live. Anytime, man. Anytime. All right. Have a good night. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you. My pleasure. Well, there you have it. The New York Hardcore Chronicles Live. Our guest today was Jason Bittner from Shadows Fall, Flotsam and Jetsam, Overkill, Stigmata, Crisis, a real hardworking career drummer uh, who really, who's really done well for himself, has slogged it out for years. Uh, in the trenches uh, in upstate New York and, and got that call and, and got the break and got that break that we all dream of. So we're so happy for him and, and everything, uh, you know, uh, that, that he's done. Laurent, glad you got the book. Uh, we love you out there in France. Uh, D, thank you. Um, what else? Kevin Heggs, thank you. Appreciate it. Oh, you know what? I just want to remind everybody. Uh, it was real quick. Let, let's do let's do the next four shows again. Uh, coming up on Sunday is Veronica from Life of Agony, another drummer. This is like the drummer show these days. Uh, after that is Tom Sorez, producer, engineer. Uh, we'll have a lot to talk about with this dude. Then the notorious, infamous, controversial Dave Ellison from formerly of Megadeth and the Lude and Altitudes and Attitudes, and then uh, Mark Nickel from MAD Tour Booking. So got lots of great stuff, uh, lots of great stuff coming up. And yeah, man. Thank you, Chris. Brilliant show. Brilliant. <laughs> I'm a lucky guy. I get to do something I love doing. Chris Hoffman, love today's show. Thank you. And thank you, thank you all for, for, for watching the show and supporting the show. Um, I said that the book... If you're a patron, the book is for free. Uh, just send me uh, shipping. Reach out to me. The second printing of the book is going up on sale probably next week. Uh, lots of good things going on in the world. Um, everybody okay? Yeah, it's all good. Yeah, it's the New York Hardcore. It's the New York Hardcore Drummers Chronicles Live. I don't know why, why I'm ending up with so many drummers these days, right? The hell what the hell is going on here you know um yeah good mark Pasoni's watching good i'm glad you're watching mark it means a lot thank you um that said all right let's call it i'll see you on sunday until then do good things and good things will come to you <laughs>